Earlier today, the House Government Reform Committee held a hearing on the fundraising activities of the Clinton-Gore campaign in the 1996 election. Former Democratic National Committee fundraiser Johnny Chung and others testified before the committee. Indiana Congressman Dan Burton chaired the hearing. It's about four and a half hours. Good afternoon, a quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform will come to order. Before the disting distinguished ranking member and I deliver our opening statements, the committee must first dispose of some procedural issues. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record. Without objection. They're reserving the right to object. Is that referred to by members during questioning? Otherwise, there's been no reference. I don't see any problem. Yeah. With that. We also gave some material to you. That, that's fine. So, and any reference, any materials that members refer to in their questioning can be made part of the record. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that a staff report and compilation of exhibits regarding Mr. Chung's testimony and documents regarding Mark Middleton be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that a letter from the Justice Department dated May 7, 1999 authorizing Mr. Chung's testimony be entered into the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the chairman and ranking minority member allocate time to the committee council as they deem appropriate for extended questioning, not to exceed 60 minutes, divided equally between the majority and the minority and without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that questioning in this matter proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the chairman and ranking minority member allocate time to members of the committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning, not to exceed 60 minutes, equally divided between the majority and minority, and without objection, so ordered. And one other item I'd like to uh, uh, mention before we start is uh, I received a letter from uh, the ranking uh, minority member, Mr. Waxman, uh, yesterday regarding uh, uh, some kind of misunderstanding regarding Mr. Sun and Mr. Chung. Uh, as far as uh, limitation on questioning. I have talked to Mr. Sun and uh, uh, Mr. Chung and uh, uh, Mr. Murphy, and uh, there is uh, no limit on questioning whatsoever, so I'm glad we're able to lay that to rest right here at the beginning so the minority will be able to ask any questions that they feel is necessary. Today's hearing is going to focus a great deal on China. I think this is important because there's a lot going on between our two countries right now. We're all very upset about the recent bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. It was a tragedy. However, we should not let that deter us from get, trying to get to the bottom of Chinese efforts to influence our elections or steal nuclear secrets. The Chinese government's actions should not be overshadowed or forgotten because of this terrible mistake. Today we're going to hear testimony about China's attempts to interfere with our elections in 1996. These are very serious allegations. Even more serious are allegations about espionage by the Chinese government at our nuclear weapons facilities. We're not going to hear testimony on this subject today, but every time I pick up a newspaper I read new allegations about Chinese spying. We have some very serious national security issues here that we need to address. If China is conducting covert operations to influence our elections, and it appears that they are, then we have to treat this as a threat to our national security. If China is stealing our nuclear secrets, and it appears that they are, then we have a threat to our national security. We have to treat it like a national security issue, and so far, we haven't. In my view, this isn't about politics, and it isn't about elections. It shouldn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. The Chinese government is taking actions toward us that are hostile 
and we have to take it seriously. Today, we have a very rare thing. We have a cooperative witness. Johnny Chung has reached a plea agreement with the Justice Department. He has cooperated with them. He received a sentence that makes it clear that the Justice Department considered him a valuable witness. Mr. Chung has agreed to testify today and tell us what he knows. Over the course of our investigation into illegal foreign money, we've had 121 people refuse to testify, 121. 80 people have taken the fifth, and a lot of people have left the country or stayed overseas where we cannot reach them. We've immunized a handful of these people, and they have testified, but we still have over 100 people who have refused to testify. Johnny Chung has told us that the head of China's military intelligence agency gave him $300,000 and told him that he could give it to the president's campaign. That's pretty astonishing, and this is just one witness. What would we learn if we could get these other 100 witnesses to testify? What would we learn from John Wong if we could get him to come forward and testify? What would we learn if we could get Charlie Tree to come forward and testify? Or Mark Middleton? Johnny Chung has also told us that within two weeks of receiving this money from General G, he gave $35,000 to the Democrat National Committee. After we finish this hearing today, some of the reporters sitting here are going to call the DNC and the White House, and I'll tell you right now what their response will be. They're going to say, we didn't know. We had no idea where Johnny Chung's money was coming from. Well, if they didn't know, then they must have been trying really hard not to find out. Just ask the federal judge in California who sentenced Mr. Chung. He said, quote, if Mr. Fowler and Mr. Sullivan didn't know what was going on, they're two of the dumbest politicians I've ever seen, end quote. And this was a Democrat judge. It's easy to understand why the judge said that. When Johnny Chung showed up at a Clinton Gore fundraiser in Los Angeles in September 1995, he had 10 Chinese nationals with him. When Johnny Chung showed up at a DNC fundraiser in Los Angeles in July 1996, he had a half a dozen Chinese nationals with him. When he went to the president's radio address in the Oval Office in March of 1995, he was accompanied by six senior Chinese executives. And we have a letter to Mr. Chung from Don Fowler, the head of the Democrat National Committee. And in it, Mr. Fowler said, quote, best of luck on your trip to China. I enjoyed meeting your friend who is a wife of the chief of staff of the Chinese army, end quote. I could go on and on, but I won't. That's just as distressing to me as that is that this administration and that this administration is still acting like that they don't know. And that's very concerning, disconcerting. Last year, the president went to China. He met with President Zhang Zemin. President Zhang said they didn't have anything to do with the foreign money being funneled into our campaigns. President Clinton just took his word for it. He didn't even challenge him. Why? Just a month ago, Prime Minister Zhu Rongji was here in Washington. Johnny Chung's revelations about his meeting with General Xi had just come out. Zhu Rongji said that he had checked with all of his top people and nobody in the Chinese government had anything to do with trying to influence our elections. He said that they had no involvement in trying to steal our nuclear secrets. And once again, the president just took his word for it. Why? We asked the Chinese government for visas to come to China, to have our investigators come to China to interview people who were involved in this fundraising. They would not give us visas. In fact, they told us if we came to China, they would arrest our investigators. Are these the actions of a government that has nothing to hide? We've asked the White House and the State Department time and time again for help, and they will not lift a finger. We've asked the Chinese government for bank records that would show where these millions of dollars originated. We've gotten absolutely nothing. Are these the actions of a government that has nothing to hide? Why won't the Clinton administration push China to turn over this evidence? The Clinton administration hasn't been very aggressive in getting to the bottom of the fundraising scandal. The nuclear espionage scandal looks even worse. The FBI tried four times, four times to get approval to tap the phones of the main suspect, suspect in the Los Alamos case. The Justice Department turned them down every time. Why? The Energy Department kept the main suspect, Wayne Ho Lee, in his job for three years. He was kept on for 18 months 
after the FBI said there was no investigative reason for him to stay on. He had access to classified information the whole time. Why? The President's national security advisors were thoroughly briefed about China's espionage, but no action was taken for over two years to improve security at those labs. And the President continued to sign waivers to ship sensitive satellites and other information to China. Why? Just yesterday, the President approved a new satellite export to China. Why is the President approving a technology transfer like this when we haven't gotten any answers on these other issues from China? These actions are serious, and these are serious issues. This is why I've been saying that these are national security issues and not political issues. Now, let me say a few things about our witness today. Johnny Chung broke the law. He's made some serious mistakes. He's done some things that we can't condone, and obviously he wasn't alone. Eighty people have taken the Fifth Amendment, and another 40 have left the country. I think Mr. Chung and his family have probably paid a pretty high price for his mistakes. But he's going to do something today that the other 100 people haven't done. He's going to testify. He's cooperated with the Justice Department, and he's cooperating with us. What he's doing today isn't going to be very easy. He's going to sit in front of this committee and all of these TV cameras and reporters and admit that he broke the law, and that takes courage. What has Mr. Chung told us? He's told us that General Ji Sheng Di, the head of the military intelligence of the People's Liberation Army, which is the equivalent of our CIA, gave him $300,000. General Ji would be the equivalent, as I said, of our CIA. It was wired to him through Lieutenant Colonel Liu Chaoying of China Aerospace, whose father was the head of the People's Liberation Army at one time and a, high, and a member of the hierarchy in the Chinese government. Mr. Chung has told us that the general told him the following, quote, we really like your president. We hope he will be reelected. I will give you 300,000 U.S. dollars, and you can give it to your president and the Democrat Party. Shortly after this, Mr. Chung gave $35,000 to the DNC. Mr. Chung has told us that he, was, that he was told other people were also giving money to, quote, do good things for China. One of the other people who was mentioned was Mark Middleton, a former high-level White House aide. He was told that Mark Middleton got a half a million dollars from a source that remains unclear. Mr. Middleton has taken the fifth with this committee. He has refused to talk to us. Johnny Chung has also told us that he was told that a Boeing representative from Hong Kong, a Mr. Young, was also working with the Chinese government. We still haven't resolved who this is. Johnny Chung has informed us that he was told by another source that Charlie Tree asked the Chinese government for $1 million to help the president. He'll testify that he saw the head of the U.S. consulate in Beijing take cash in exchange for visas. This is just outrageous. Did Mark Middleton get a half a million dollars from the Chinese government? If he did, what was it for? Did Charlie Tree try to get a million dollars from the Chinese government? And did he get it? We know that he got over $1 million from a Macau developer with close ties to China. Johnny Chung isn't going to solve all of these mysteries for us today. Some of the things he witnessed firsthand, others he witnessed secondhand. In some ways, his testimony will raise more questions than it answers. Unfortunately, when you have an investigation that has faced the kind of massive stonewalling that we have, you make progress by inches instead of feet. Is Johnny Chung credible? Is he telling the truth? Well, the Justice Department thought so. They worked with him for a year. When it came time for him to be sentenced, they did not recommend jail time. They did not recommend a stiff fine. They recommended probation and community service. And that says a lot about his credibility. But did we, but we did some digging on our own. We subpoenaed a lot of documents over the last two years. We went back through all of these documents to see if they supported Johnny Chung's story or not. And in most cases, they do. We looked at his passport. When Johnny Chung says he was in Hong Kong meeting with Liu Chao Ying and General Ji, his passport shows that he was there. He told us that he had to change his plans and travel back to Hong Kong that day from mainland China for the, for the dinner. His passport backs that up. He said that Liu Chao Ying told him that Mark Middleton got a half a million dollars from a Singapore group. We checked Mark Middleton's bank records, and they show that he received over $1.75 from Asian businesses. One of the payments he received 
was a half a million dollar payment from Indonesia. We don't know what money Lu Chao Ying was referring to. If we could go to Hong Kong to interview Lu Chao Ying, maybe we could find out, but the Chinese government will not allow that. We have a copy of a letter from Mark Middleton to one of his associates in Singapore, and I think we can put that up on the screen real briefly. I'm not sure everybody can read that. It's pretty small print. It mentions someone named Lu. It says, and I quote, thank you for the update on Ms. Lu. I know that she must be concerned with nepotism, but I'm not sure how that affects us, end quote. We don't know what Mark Middleton meant in this letter. He's taken the fifth, so we can't ask him. Johnny Chung told us that in the fall of 1995, the DNC pressured him to contribute $70,000. We found an internal DNC memo from that time period to Chairman Fowler of the DNC. He was being asked to call Mr. Chung and tell him, quote, that bad things will happen, end quote, if he didn't come up with the money. We've assembled a staff report that lists Mr. Chung's statements and shows that there are documents to back them up. At the end of my statement, I will ask unanimous consent that they be entered into the record. Let me conclude by trying to put all this into perspective. Why does any of this matter? Why should anyone care? As I said at the beginning of my statement, this is a very serious national security issue. The Chinese government was making a concerted effort to undermine our political system. They were conducting aggressive espionage at our nuclear labs. These aren't the actions of an ally. These are the actions of an adversary. Yet until all of this came out in the media, I have seen no evidence that this administration took it seriously. On a couple of occasions, the president said that he believed the Chinese government. Why? Yesterday, the president, as I said before, approved a new technology transfer to China. He signed a new waiver to export a sensitive satellite to China once again. In the face of all the, of China's actions, the president is plowing forward with negotiations to bring China into the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Why? Is this the right way to respond to China's actions? I think the American people need to know the facts so they can judge for themselves. That's why we're holding this hearing. I don't think that this is a partisan agenda or a partisan issue. Everyone ought to be concerned about China's actions, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. I voted against MFN for China. A number of my Democrat friends also did. We voted no because we have very, very serious concerns about the way China has behaved. I'd like to make one final note. Over the past two years, we've examined a lot of illegal contributions. We've seen over and over again people making contributions in someone else's name. They do this to hide their identity or exceed the legal limits. It's obvious that this is a very serious problem. The penalties on the books for making conduit contributions are not stopping people from doing it. Later today, I'm going to introduce the Conduit Contribution Prevention Act. My bill will make this a felony instead of a misdemeanor. It would make civil penalties tougher as well. We need to stop those conduit contributions. I would like to invite everyone on the committee, Democrat or Republican, to co-sponsor this bill. It should be a nonpartisan issue. I now recognize my colleague, Mr. Waxman, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have just a, I have just a brief comment about the approach I'm going to take at this hearing. I generally accord witnesses a presumption that they're telling us the truth in their testimony. Unfortunately, due to false accusations Mr. Chung has made about others and inconsistent statements he has made on key points regarding his campaign contributions, I can't give him that presumption today. Equally as important, I don't presume he's not telling us the truth. I commend him for cooperating with the Justice Department and for appearing before this committee and I'm most interested in his testimony. Our committee's role is not to unquestionably accept information or selectively highlight pieces that might fit into preconceived theories. In that spirit, I believe our job this afternoon is to evaluate all the statements Mr. Chung has made and simply assess whether what he is telling us today is reliable and credible. I look forward to the uh, testimony. At this point, would you rise, Mr. Chung?
raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Tell me God. Good morning, Mr. Chung, Mr. Sun, Mr. Murphy, and Ms. Cohen. Ms. Cohen's back there in the back. Okay. Uh, I think right now we would appreciate if you would go ahead and make your opening statement. And because you have a lot of ground to cover, we will not put any limitations on your time because you have a story to tell and we want to hear it all. So Mr. Chung, we'll now hear from your, hear your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and the member of the Committee of the Government Reform and Oversight. <clears throat> my name is Johnny Chong. I rest in Atisha, California with my wife, Kathy, and three children. I have been asked to testify before this committee on a matter related to certain political contribution. I made it from 1994 through 1996. With your permission, Mr. Chairman, I will read this written statement and ask that it be made part of a record of this proceeding today. That objection, so ordered. In testifying before the committee, I hope to clear the record once and for all regarding a number of matters that have touched my life so deeply. In particular, I hope to address and clear up a number of issues that had been raised concerning the motivation and circumstance surrounding my political contribution between 1994 and 1996, and in particular, many falsehood a misleading statement made by the media, politicians, and others. Concerning my experiences, I therefore welcome the opportunity to tell my full story to you today. During last meeting in November 1997, I advised you through my counsel that I was unable to provide you with the details of certain of my business relationship due to pending criminal investigation by the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice has now agreed that I may testify with certain limitations, and I will make every effort to provide this committee with full and accurate information and to answer as many questions as possible that I previously was unable to answer. After my testimony is complete, I'm looking forward to put this matter behind me once and for all. After the outset, I must make the statement and observation that I believe my testimony here today will probably disappoint a lot of people. Contrary to what some people think. I have never acted as an agent for the Chinese government. I have never thought to do anything that might facilitate any sinister attempt to undermine the interests of my country's United States, which I love. Far from it, I am a first-generation immigrant, a US citizen who, like your forefathers do not speak English as good as my children and my wife do. But I am as loyal to my country as any of you. One of my deep regrets about this entire matter has been the terrible impact that the campaign finance scandal caused in part of myself has had upon Asian American and in particular, Chinese American. This controversy, which has been intensified by partisan politics, 
and sometimes vicious and overreaching media has caused me to feel that there will be a reassurance of some type of anti-Chinese hysteria as we have seen historically in this country before. It is my hope that my testimony will help put a stop to the type of inflammatory columns written by people like Mr. Sapphire in the New York Times and others who seem to want to brand everything on China and cast doubt on the loyalty of the Chinese American such as myself. In this regard, I would, not, I would note that the Chinese American and Asian American have for over a century contributed to the growth and greatness of America. Asian Americans, like your ancestors, have contributed and participated in every level of our society. However, in my view, we have not been successful in being fully participated in the political process. I would note that there is not a single Asian American member of this committee except for Ms. Monk of Hawaii. And every few Asian American in Congress or at the high level of our government, the system is set up so that if you donate money, you can participate. To participate in the American political process, Asian American, like myself, some Asians, like, just like any other group through the system, we did not create. It is about this system that I will tell my story and how it ultimately destroyed my business and my reputation. In telling my story to you, I must make one other observation and request. It seems to me that the American people deserve an answer from you politicians who talk a lot about changing and improving the system. Yet, more than two years after this controversy erupted, you, the Congress, have done nothing to change this system. Indeed, within the last month, I received an invitation to a fundraiser where I might have got yet another photo opportunity with some politician. Although most of you would probably run away from me at this point, what I want to say here is that I hope my testimony doesn't really end up being a shouting match between you Republicans or Democrats. You are attacking each other or attacking others who have, who have had their reputation rooted in some instance without any justification, serve no useful purpose. If you really want to do something about this, then change the system. That allow me to, with a few select donation, attract the interest of the head of Chinese military intelligence. In other words, although I certainly feel I have some responsibility in this matter, I also think you should look to yourself and ask yourself if you really want to do something about this, about some laws and regulation that limit the need for such huge amount of the money in order to run a po political campaign, both sides are probably equally at the fore for letting this need for money get out of hand. We unfortunately live in a system where the ambassadorship can be bought and stay in the, at the White House can cost as little as 50,000 or access to our president or a presidential candidate can be had if you are famous in Hollywood. Again, please keep in mind that I didn't create this system. You did. 
I therefore ask this committee to keep in mind that I don't think I am alone in suggest that you politicians have the opportunity to be either hero or hypocrite. I hope my testimony will help you ultimately to become heroes. When the historian write about this chapter in our history, hopefully they will say that our dem democracy survived the challenge of partisan politics and we were able to create a stronger and a better country. You politicians should not always know, should not always count out to the media who are allowed to influence you way too much. Our media which doesn't hesitate to destroy one's reputation without solid facts. Were it not for the support of my family and the member of my church, I'm not sure I would have been able to have the strength to deal with the, the public and personal attack on my characters. I do remind hopeful that I will tell my story today. You will understand that this former bus boy and supposed friend of the president and the politician has paid a very high price for my involvement in the politics. I found myself wearing a body wire and along with my family at one point in protected custody. I simply want to go back to a normal life, where I can become an active and contributing member of my committee once again. I would like now, Mr. Chairman, to talk about my personal and business background, which lead me to get involved in this matter. I was born and raised in Taiwan and came to the United States in 1983. After working as a busboy and working in Holiday Inn, I ultimately opened my own business in late 1980s. After having mixed success, I started a fax broadcasting business using what was then fairly new technology. However, my desire to expand this business required a substantial amount of capital. As a consequence, I was constantly looking for a shareholder or investor to help me ultimately take this business public. By 1992, I began to target my business toward government agencies, political candidates, and elect officials who I believed could get the most useful benefit from a fast broadcasting capability. As my business record reflect, I was able to get business from a number of political candidates and ultimately secure a contract with the state of California from then Governor P. Wilson's office. As a consequence of my effort to develop business, I traveled extensively to many of the office of the governor throughout the country, including the then governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton. It was ultimately at the National Governor's Conference in 1994 that I first came in contact with an official of the Clinton administration, who later invited me to attend my first significant fundraiser, the President's 48th birthday party in August 1994. It was after this event that I began to realize the value and in importance that political donation could have on my ability to get access and to further my business contacts. I also find it to be exciting. I can never forget the drill that me and my family and my parents had. When we first met with the president and the first lady at, the, at the his birthday party, while you elect official may be used to that kind of things, most Americans 
I think, including my family, were very much impressed and overwhelmed by this event. You get the feeling when you go to these things that you are VIP. And even though people treat us like a VIP, only because we give the money, you still feel good. I begin to realize, however, that I could also get a little something back for giving money. I saw the opportunity in attending this event and getting pictures with the people like the president and the vice president and others as an opportunity to promote my business and in particular the possibility of access for potential shareholders, investors, or other business clients. And as I will relate it to you shortly, my first contact with how many people in December 1994 <clears throat> started me on the road toward attracting investor and relationship from a number of the business people based in People's Republic of China. Later did I know then that this relationship would ultimately cause me a great headache. At the time, I saw it as a great, a great opportunity. <clears throat> One thing, I should try to make it very clear at this point, beginning at 1995 through the end of 1996, my business relationship in China involved from effort to obtain fax business to a business con consulting relationship where I perform my many where I perform many services for this Chinese business contact. It is important to have people understand that much of what these people want from me one way or beyond me simply just take them to a fundraiser. These people want me to do everything from assisting them in getting a visa to enter this country, to escorting them around the country, providing interpreter service, paying their expenses, and making instruction in introduction to both business and government contact. Certainly, it was very important to these people to have picture taken with high-level American government official. For people who do business in China, pictures are worth the, day, the weight in gold. Just like many American companies such as Coca-Cola or Pepsi will spend minimum to advertise in a Super Bowl game, these business people and their company treasure photographic with the important people because in China, such a photograph project a great sense of importance and reflect the degree of your importance. As a consequence, they were willing to provide me significant sum of money to help them to get this photo. We in America sometimes don't realize how important such things are in other cultures. In addition, I promote myself to these people as someone who could get a lot of such, such things done, and that if they provide me with a con counseling fee or choose to invest in my company, I could assist their business effort in the United States. <coughs> It is my opinion that much of what these people want from me has less to do with influence, influencing any election as it was, it was to get what most Americans want from our system. Influence and the ability to develop relationship with the important people. A lot of the people I met in China like Americans 
and want to move here or send their children here for education. In fact, despite the recent controversy about technology and espionage, a lot of Chinese I met in People of Republic of China admire America and want to do business and develop friendship. Much has been written and said about me being a conduit for a foreign source donation to the Democrat National Committee. I have told the FBI, and I previously have maintained that whenever I was giving money, it was generally to provide a number of service for my business partner, client, or investor. While there is no doubt that these people had some understanding that when I took them to an event, I would often have to donate to get them in. There was never any discussion about how much to give or when to give. Perhaps the only exception was my encounter with Ji Shende, which I will discuss in a moment, in, in, in a moment for the most part However, I choose when, when to go to the event, who to invite, and how much I was to give. I usually decide wh whether to attend an event depending on whether or not I was trying to select someone for business and impress them, or demonstrate to them that I had the ability get them to meet the president or some important figure and have their photo taken with them. For whatever reason, this ability to do this service, among others, suggests that, suggests to many who I deal, who I deal with in the People's Republic that I have connection and could introduce them to powerful people in this country. I will note for the record that I received in excess of two million from 1994 to 1996 as a result of my business relationship in China. Less than 20% of that sum was actually donated to political causes. A substantial portion of that money was used to e either pay the expense of my business, the expense of entertaining and providing service to this business group and to return investment back to some of my shareholders. Even with the incident involved Ji and Liu Taoyin, I have never, I never intend for my business to be used to make illegal political contribution. I always intend that I would have the ability to decide what to do, what to do with the money after I receive it. Before I turn to a specific discussion of the various events and individuals that I deal with between 1994 and 1996, I would like to say that I am very disappointed in the way that the Democrat National Committee has treated me in this matter. They prejudge my case, attack me publicly, and even attempt to persuade Judge Rio. The judge who sentenced me last December that I somehow was an evil man and deserved a great punishment. I think that they should be ashamed of themselves for attempting to jump on me and hide from the fact that they aggressively selected me for money from August 1994 until the campaign finance controversy came to the light in late 1996. I now realize that they took my money with a smile and made fun of me when I turned my back. Today, I have mixed feelings about the President and the First Lady 
but I can't help but think that they use me as much as I use them. I also think, however, that it was grossly unfair for the DNC to attack me when they were fully aware that I am doing a lot of business and cultivated friendship with the people from the People's Republic of China. I feel vindicated when Judge Rio at my sentence said that if the DNC don't know about my business relationship, they had not been the dumbest politician he had ever seen. Most important, I thought it was vicious from them to write a letter to Judge Rio when they did not know the true facts, particularly after I had secretly cooperated with the government. World about a while, put myself and my family at the potential risk. And for some period of time, living in fear and uncertainty. On the other hand, the DNC certainly was not aware of the contact that were made by Mr. G. And the incident involved my receipt of $300,000 from Liu Chaoying in August 1996. I will now turn to my recollection of those events and other matters that I believe are of some interest to this committee. Liu Chaoyin. <clears throat> I first met Liu Chaoyin in a restaurant in Hong Kong in June 1996. At the dinners, I attended with one of my business associates. There were a number of uh, big tables full of people at the, these dinners. Apparently, Liu had heard that I might be able to get her access to high labor people in Washington, D.C. And you asked me if I would be willing to get her an invitation to United States. I agreed. And I eventually she and I agreed and eventually she came part of the meetings and events that I had already scheduled in July nineteen ninety six for Mr. Yao and others. I was going from Los Angeles to New York with Mr. Yao, who at that time wanted to take this company public. I had previously met Federal Reserve employee Israel Sandovic on a cross-country plane trip. And Mr. Yao asked me if I could set up a meeting for this official. I took Liu along during this meeting with the officials in New York and Washington, D.C. She seemed impressed and told me that she wanted to do business with me. She explained that she was thinking of putting a company on the New York Stock Exchange. She said she would give me $300,000 that I was supposed to use to help her set up her business, which was supposed to be a telecommunication and commercial fishing in southern China. I then set up Maxwell Investment in late July, early August 1996 for this purpose. At that time, I used my own money to set up the company, but I expect that this cost would ultimately come out of 300,000 Liu Chaoyin had promised me. During the Washington DC event with the Liu and Mr. Yao, I introduced Liu to Dan Farrow as the daughter of a powerful general. Farrow joked that he had a low ranking in World War II. Also, during that trip, I had a discussion with the Liu Chaoyin at the Willow Hotel. Liu Chaoyin asked me if I had a Hong Kong bank account. I said yes, 
and give her my bank account number in Hong Kong by writing boy across a blank check and gave it the check to her. During this conversation, Yu Chao Yin also told me, don't do business with, the, with the Mr. Yao, just do business with me. I was still not sure if she would provide $300,000. I did notice on this occasion and on other occasion that a picture of me was missing after I met with Liu Chao Yin. The other occasion was during one trip on my visit to Hong Kong. Also, during my various discussion with Liu Chao Yin, she informed me that she was going to change her travel plan as a result of what she felt were our very productive meeting. Originally, she had scheduled to go back to Hong Kong. After this trip, by changing her plan so that she could go directly to Beijing. She later told me that the reason that she went to Beijing instead of Hong Kong was so that she could tell her father about her trip. August 1996, meeting with General G. On August 7, 1996, I returned to Hong Kong with my daughter and her friend. On August 11, we were in Zhuhai, which is across the border from Macau and in China, where I received a phone call from Liu Chao Yin, and she invited me to a dinner with someone who she said was a very important man from Beijing. I accept the invitation. The dinner was on August 11, 1996. Liu Chao Yin picked me up in her car, and we went to a restaurant which is famous for its abalone. I don't remember the, the, the name and the, of the restaurant. She told me that the man we were going to meet was, uh, was very important. Liu Chao Yin said that I should not be afraid to talk myself up, and she encouraged me to show him my brochure. Liu Chao Yin told me that I was much more impressed prospect than Charlie Tree because I had a better connection than Charlie Tree, and that my brochure was much better than Tree's. I also would like to add one oddity that stuck out in my mind. At one point during our conversation, Yu Chao Yin made a regular phone call from the restaurant basement. I asked her how she could make a call from a basement. She said there was a special antenna. When General Ji arrived, he came through the kitchen and introduced himself as Mr. Xu, the Chinese equipment of Mr. Smith. The general said, you can call me Mr. Xu. And it was clear from the way he said this that it was a bold name. I and Liu Tao Yin spoke with the Ji about her <coughs> I and Liu Chao Yin spoke with Ji about her recent trip. Talking up the past time, I was able to get meeting with the politician and dignitary. Liu Chao Yin was very different, differential to Ji in a way that it made me think we was her boss, he was her boss or superior. The key information related to me at this dinner from Ji was the following. We really like your president. We hope he will be reelected. Or we like him to be reelected. I will give you 300 US thousand, 300,000 US dollars. You can give it to or use it for your president 
and Democrat Party. I was somehow stunned by this proposal. I wonder who is this man really was. However, I don't want to insult him or insult you, so I remain quiet and agreeable. I say something like, this is fine. It would be great to do business together. The more business I can do, then the money, more money I can give to the president and the Democrat Party. She then led through the kitchen, and then we led the way we, the way we came in. No one paid the bill. When I got in the car with the deal, she put her finger up to her lips and indicated that I should not talk while they were in the car with the driver. When we got out of the car, I asked, who is he? And she told me the general's name and who he was. I did not recognize the name. And Deuce called me and said that I need to know my Chinese history better. She explained that this, his predecessor was the govern, government officials who said that the American government should be more worried about missile headed to Los Angeles than Taiwan. She then told me she was a military intelligence director of the People's Liberal Army. She wrote down his name on a small piece of paper and gave it to me, and I put the paper in my pocket. Since my daughters and her friend were there, I was not going to make a big deal about this. At that time, I was staying with a friend. The next day, I told my friend who I met with. And my friend said that she is a very important person. I also showed my friend in Zhuhai the piece of papers with the name, and he recognized the name. Second meeting with the Liu Taoyin and Zhang Longji. On August 13, 1996, I met again with the Liu Taoyin and General Ji back in Hong Kong. We met at the hotel lobby in the bar. The hotel is next to the Shangri-La Hotel. I first was with the Liu, and then General Ji come in to join us. And Ji said to me, now you know who I am. He told me that his name was so sensitive that he, were, he still want me to call him by the alias, Mr. Xi. Xi spoke in, Chi in Chinese to Liu, said, I will wire $300,000 to your account, and you wire to him. Xi said he need a receipt or report to give it to organization. At this point, Mrs. G came into the bar and sat with us and talked, changed to talk about children. General G had a son who was attending UCLA, and his son wanted to stay at the UCLA and in the United States. Mrs. G said the son Alex was the favorite of the, his grandfather. It was a very informal discussion of mama, mothers and fathers talk, talking about their kids. Mrs. G also said she was going to come back to United States where she told me she had already lived for 11 years. Alex began to work at AISI, my company. Shortly after I returned from this trip, he worked begin in October and November 1996 and on and off 
through February 1997. After G left this meeting, I briefly expressed to you my concern about getting involved with the general's money. My understanding was that she was going to give me the 300,000 and now that was changing and I didn't want to get involved in this kind of arrangement. I then went back to my hotel room. The next morning, August 14, Liu called me early and was yelling at me about not having a US dollar account in Hong Kong. I had previously given her my account number at the Hong Kong bank. Liu always talk in full language, and she said to me, damn it, her language was worse than this. However, how come you don't have a US dollar account? I told her to come over after she was done so I could talk with her. When she came over later that day, I continued to raise my concern about getting the money from General G instead of Liu herself. I also pointed out that the money was supposed to be for the various, uh, various business deal we had discussed in July. In response, she told me that I could use the money for three things. I could give it to the president and the Democrat party. I could use it to take care of the general's son, Alex. And I could use it for my own purpose, business, and to set up my and Liu's companies. I told you I was concerned because she had promised me her money and now this was something different. In, I, in what I perceived as an effort to persuade me that it was okay to do this, to do it this way. She told me that Mark Middleton also got half million from a Singapore group from someone named Huang, Huang or Wang, W-O-N-G. And the purpose of the money was to do good things for China or to benefit China. She also mentioned it, foreign representative in Hong Kong, who she said they give a lot of business to do. In conjunction with the Boeing representative, the name Yang was mentioned. She also said that we gave him the business in order for him to do good things for China. I did not have first name of this Mr. Yang. My sense was that I was told this, so I won't be worried and taking his, this money from Ji and Liu Taoyin. My impression of this other example was that they were involved in developing relationship and access to help China. I had limited the dealing with the Mark Middleton, but now who he, but I, I knew who he was when you mentioned him. I had met through Richard Sullivan in 1994 and had contacted him in early 1995 to talk about a friend who needs some assistance with a Swiss bank account. The friend was Ruth Lin, a child of a rich Chinese family. Supposedly, she was prepared to help the DNC if she could get help from this bank account. She told me that there were people who were trying to kill her and she wanted to get the family bank's account in Switzerland. I called Sullivan and asked him to have Mark Middleton call to help her. I also asked Middleton to call her too. Middleton told me that my associate Larry Liu was also praising him to do something for her. I also saw Middleton at the White House when I visited in 1996. After this representation from 
representation from Lu, I keep the money which actually had already been transferred into my account that morning by Liu. I never had any intention to give the 300,000 to the Democrat, and I ended up following Liu's advice and used the money primarily for myself and for helping the general's sons. Although I did make some donation to DNC that was from the same account into which you made the deposit. I commingle money from multiple sources into this account, and I did not intend for donation to come strictly from the fund. I also donated to John Kerry in this time, in this time frame, but in my mind, I had already obligated myself to contribute to Kerry back in July. When his people arranged the meeting at the SEC, for Liu Taoyin and Mr. Yao. As I have said before, although I received money from many sources, I alone decide how and when to donate it, who to donate it, and how much. I believe my bank account at the Overseas Trust Limited short a while been received on August 14, 1996, and then it went to my Calfab Bank account. I wrote a check for the president's birthday party from that account. On August 16, 1996, I transferred the money from Calfab to General Bank in order to make a contribution to DNC. I also, I would also note that on this same day, Mr. Yao wired $200,000 into this same overseas trust account. I always consider the money in this account, including the money from Jano, to be my money. And I was free to do with what I want. I emphasize the expect for the Jano. No one told me to give money to the Democrat. All of the money I received, I have reported as income. I next saw Jano G's wife when she came back to the United States with her son. I set up their attendance at the presidential fundraiser, the Back to the Future event, at the California Movie Studio on October 17, 1996. I took my driver and secretary, as well as the Jano's, Jano's wife and Alex to meet with the president. There was a mix up with the DNC, and my driver and secretary were given a private audience with the president, while me and the general's wife and son were not included. While my driver and secretary were very appreciated, I was very upset. When the president came into the main event, I moved my way to the front and got in contact with the president and introduced the general's wife and son. The president spoke with Alex and asked him what he was majoring at the college. A picture was then ta taken by the general's wife or Alex, but I do not know what happened to it. Ultimately, I did not donate any money to DNC for this event because they made a mistake. With the introduction and photo opportunity, Karen Stenfeld of the DNC complained to me that I didn't give, give that enough money, and I explained to her that this was a very important guest, and they had made a mistake. I said Irene Wu, my employee, usually, usually handle all the the detail in setting up attendance at this event, and she had to call the general's wife and the son to set this up. At this event, I tried to talk with the Democrat National Committee Chairman, Dan Fallow, and Mr. Fallow, 
scolded me for not meeting my fundraising obligation. At some point in the fall of 1996, General G raised concerns with me that Utahin can only get a one entry visa instead of the multiple entry visa that she had received on a previous occasion. Before the July 1996 Eli Bros fundraiser, I went with the Liu to get a visa in Guangzhou, China, and told a female consular officer that she was a general's daughter and that she previously had a multiple entry visa she should get a multiple entry visa again. After you deposit the money into my account, I wrote a letter August 18, 1996, to get Yu Tao in an invitation to Washington, D.C. and to go to the Democrat National Convention. At this point, Liu didn't get her visa and she couldn't come. Down Father also invited her to come to the convention. Our parish. In early 1995, Mr. He, the president of Howman Bill, asked me to obtain a visa because he was his visa was expired. I had previously met with Mr. He when I took him, took he and <clears throat> a delegation around Washington, D.C. in December 1994. In order for them to promote their beer in the United States. I took Mr. He to the United States Embassy where I was introduced to Charles Parrish. I felt at that time Mr. Parrish and I sort of hit and off and we're going to be a friends. It was not until late that I became aware that Mr. Parrish and Mr. He of Howman Beer had developed a separate relationship. Charles Parrish helped me get visa for dozens of peoples who I asked me, who asked me to provide them with the invitation to United States. I also socialized and did many favors to Mr. Pa Mr. Parrish. I took him as my guest to September 1995 DNC fundraiser at the Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles to which he also brought his sister and his girlfriend. At that event, I took Parrish to a private VIP reception with the President Bill Clinton. Mr. Parrish insists that Mr. He and Mr. He's girlfriend have the opportunity to have their picture taken with the President. This was a request that prompted the DNC to ask me for an additional $70,000 contribution. After the Century Plaza event, I arranged a private tour of the First Lady's Hillary Clinton's office for Mr. Parrish when both he and I were in Washington, D.C. At the Mr. Parrish request, I give invitation to the United States to at the least two women who will girlfriend of his. In Beijing, Parrish would occasionally stop by my office. On one of these visits, he asked me to hire a computer tutor to train his secretary at the embassy. I spent $500 of my own money accommodating this request. He also asked me to pay the tuition for seven students who he knew that want to be educated in the United States. Although I did not know this student, I spent between seven to 8,000 of my own money doing this for Mr. Parrish, including sending school supplies like a computer program and book directly to Beijing at his request. 
Child Parish did help me out on many occasions. As I stated previously, he approved visa application for business associate that I brought to him. However, by the end of 1995, I decided I did not want to continue my relationship with Mr. Parrish. Part of the reason who I no longer want to deal with Parrish was because he and Mr. He had entered into a relationship that I was not comfortable with. On at least one occasion, I was asked by Mr. He to give a shopping bag of the money and visas to Parrish. Several months later, Mr. Parrish asked me, I want to make a, a collection here. I was asked by Mr. He to give a shopping bag of money and a passport to Mr. Parrish. Several months later, Mr. Parrish asked me to have Mr. He call him. Parrish said that he wanted to be sure that this those, these people, he provide visa for actually come back to China. Later, Parrish told me that indeed they did return to China. I became unhappy with the way I was being treated with my business associate in Beijing, so I decided to close my office. Too many people will ask me for visa rather than doing business with me. The gentleman. Robert Lu. Early in 1996, when I was in Beijing, I said I was called in the middle of the night by a man named Chui Bao Jian, connected with the Great War International Cultural Company, who woke me up and said I need to come over to where he was at the karaoke bar. I went there and walked into the room where I was directed and it was conference conference size room with the men and the women around a table. I was introduced to the people, and one of the people in the room was Mr. Lu, Robert Lu, who was a Chinese American US citizen who was in Beijing and had not gone back to the state because of some legal problem. He asked me how to handle his case, and I told him he should go back to the United States to walk it out. I next meet, met Lou in mid 1996. Lou came to the AISI office in Los Angeles, where I met him at approximately 10 minutes. Lou discussed a business proposal. The next time, I heard from Lou was before my pre in February 1998. I received a call at my business office from Mr. Lou. A message was left that I have received a phone call from Mr. Lou from Beijing. I didn't remember who Lou was and I did not call him back. I pre guilty in March 1998 and began being debriefed by the FBI, do call me again. At that time, I had been told by the FBI to keep recording device to record any suspicious conversation. So I did so with this man. In late April, early May 1998, Lou called me and asked how I was doing. He also spoke sympathetically about me being a difficult situation. Lou asked me to meet, uh, Lou asked to meet me and I obtained a specific instruction from the FBI about how to deal with Lou again. I was instructed to record all of their conversation. In their first meeting, Lou stayed, stated talking about Commander Lee, who want to take care of me. The message, the message was as follow. If you keep your mouth shut, you and your family will be safe. The Chinese are more polite and indirect 
than these. So the words do not precisely translate. The Chinese communication was much more stop, subtle. Nevertheless, this was how I interpreted the, me, the meaning of the words. Essentially, the message that I believe I was give, given was that me and my family would be safe if I didn't talk and if I didn't talk. If I did talk. I could not be certain what, ha what would happen. At the minimum, I believe I was being threatened. The FBI told me that they suspect Lu might have a criminal connection. Lu also suggests he was in contact with some people from Beijing who were also know, known to me. Lu also mentioned that he received money from Beijing. Lu said they would give me money to take care of my legal expense and my family, and I could retire. Lu also asked if we could meet again and give me an address. I was, I was also given a call to use. This was the early May throughout this proceeds. The FBI was monitoring communication. The FBI identified Lu as a San Gabriel businessman. In the next meeting with Lu, I raised question about my security. We met in an open area for about 10 minutes and Lu wanted to know the name of my judge. Lu also gave me the business card of an attorney. He told me he wanted me to meet the attorney at the downtown location and asked me to, to bring my case, case file. Again, Lu inquired about my family and he again implied that I should keep, I should keep quiet and that. If I did so, things will be okay. Lou also told me that he would give me money to pay for my legal bills and say that he thought it possible that Chinese political prisoner can be, could be released if I didn't, I did not cooperate. At that time, I feel Lou was skeptical in the same way that I had it in script by the FBI, script, I'm sorry, by the FBI. In the first week of May, I learned that the New York Times was doing a story that involved Liu, Liu Taoyin and the $300,000. The FBI and I were very concerned that the news story would scare Mr. Liu off. My attorney and I tried to get the New York Times to kill the story, that refused him. On the, on the day before the story came out, May 15, 1998, I ended up going forward with the meeting with the Lou and his attorney. I consulted with the FBI before I proceed. The plan was to tell Lou and the attorney that the New York Times may come out with a bogus story and I was going to say that the FBI was really beating me up on me, and I actually gave the name of an FBI agent business card. When I met with the attorney and Mr. Liu, there were FBI agents throughout the building. I was told the attorney was connected and knew the number three person at the DOJ, Department of Justice and that he was familiar with the judge. And that was precise, presiding over my case. Lou and attorney were pitching in me to replace my lawyer, Mr. Sun. The lawyer gave me an example of someone who did not cooperate and everyone around him was taking care of him. He said, that this crime was sentenced to a country club jail. 
One of the things that the FBI encouraged me to ask Mr. Lu was who is behind you? When I asked him, Lu responded by giving me a nickname that I gave him previously to Liu Taoyin. The nickname was Gu Niang, which means country girl. Liu said Gu Niang was happy that I was protecting, protecting her. Liu also mentioned General Ji. Liu also suggested they could print a newspaper story and that I might be able to get a presidential pardon. Separately, Mr. Mr. Liu implied that they could ensure that the judge would give me a light sentence. The attorney also said he had experience with Watergate. I asked him how he could help me. I I was coached by the FBI to skeptical and praise for the answers. In this meeting, Mr. Liu said that they could take care of my attorney fee. I was very nervous during this meeting, and afterward, the FBI concluded that I had to be moved to a safe place. At that time, they moved me to a hotel for 21 days with my family. My daughter, who was graduated in the same, in the, this time frame, had to go to graduation with an FBI escort. I also had my phone, phone call and faxes. I also had many phone call and faxes with Mr. Liu, both before and after this meeting. This was the period of the, the great strait for me and my family. There were at least a dozen meetings and conversations between me and Lou during May, June, and July. After the president's visit to China in summer of 1998, on the Memorial Day weekend, Lou said he had the money at, the, at his house for me to pick it up, but the FBI was afraid for me to be alone at his house. And they didn't have me go through with the pick it up. At another point, Lou was going to put money in an account for me, but he didn't come through with it. By July, Mr. Lou started making self servants in statement on the tape and try to distance himself from previous statement. I was instructed by the FBI to tell Mr. Liu that I was going to be subpoenaed by the grand jury and that I had to tell the truth. And Mr. Liu at that point had to talk about how he thought he was being followed or taped and he told me to tell the truth. By the end of the summer, I told Mr. Liu that I was going to subpoena and ask what I should do. By this time, Mr. Liu sus suspect something was going on. Either he was under surveillance or he was being taped. And he began making, making self-serving statement and uh, exculpatory statements. Lou said if he were ever caught, he would deny everything and that he doesn't know Liu Taoyin, doesn't know anybody. Lou told me that at this point that I should tell the truth. Lou also said at this point that he just wanted to get my case for the other lawyer. I also asked Lou if I should bring this on General G and Mr. Liu, Mr. Liu said, sure. <clears throat> the Guniang would like to, to do that. My last question to Lu was, uh, what should I tell them about you? This question made Lu very uncomfortable, and Lu said, I know nobody. I am nobody. I told him I couldn't lie 
to the grand jury. I worked with the FBI throughout this entire effort and was coached on what to say to Lou. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chung. That was a very, very thorough statement, and uh, we do appreciate that. I'll now recognize the committee's chief counsel, Barbara Comstock, uh, for 30 minutes for questioning. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chung, and Mr. Sun, and Mr. Murphy, and Ms. Cohen. I want to thank you, and I want to note for the record that um, we had met approximately two weeks ago, uh, majority counsel, uh, myself, and Mr. Wilson, and Mr. Griffin, and also minority counsel were included in that meeting. And we appreciate your working with us you know, for two days to informally discuss this and with your cooperating with us in this matter. I know it's been a long ordeal for you, Mr. Chung, and your family, and I appreciate your testimony here today. Now, Mr. Chung, on March 17, 1998, you pled guilty to charges of making almost $30,000 in conduit contributions to the Clinton Gore 96 campaign, as well as Senator John Kerry's campaign, and you also pled guilty to charges involving bank fraud and tax evasion, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and in your plea agreement, you agreed to cooperate with the government and, and with all the investigations, correct? That's correct. Okay, and I know when we were out at that meeting a couple of weeks ago, we met with um, the FBI agent, J.J. Uh, Smith was with us, is that correct? That's correct. And he was the agent you worked with throughout your cooperation? Yes, that was the okay. agent who, who I worked with. It. Okay, and I know he had expressed um, your cooperation to us when we were there, and was that your impression throughout your time working with Mr. Smith? Yes. Okay, and as a result of that cooperation, you were given a sentence of five years probation and 3,000 hours of community service, correct? That's correct. Okay, and from what we've been told from Justice Department and FBI sources familiar with your case, this is the type of sentence that is only provided to witnesses who the government feels provided both substantive information as well as you know, a great deal of cooperation. Was that your understanding also? That's correct. Okay. Now, I understand as a result of that cooperation, you and your family have also experienced what you were just testifying to, both you and the FBI perceived as possible threats against your security? That's correct. Okay. And I think we'll, we'll get to that a little later, but um, I guess it's clear that you have feared for your safety and even more so the safety of your family? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now, as you explained to us, Mr. Chung, back a few years ago, you were very much a welcome person at the White House, correct? I guess so. You were at many of the fundraisers and events. I believe you were at the White House almost 50 times. Is that correct? That's correct. And when this matter first became public in um, late 96 and then early 1997, um, you had made the observation that you thought the White House was like a subway. Quote, you have to put coins in to open the gates. Was that your observation? Yes, that's correct. And as a result of this access that you had to the White House and other high-ranking um, administration officials, um, that made you known in China as somebody who had a lot of high-ranking connections. Is that correct? That, that's correct. That's correct. Okay, could you tell, you told us about when you, after you had the Hauman Beer people in December 1994, you had a, um, they had pictures taken with the president and when you went back to China in 1995, how were you greeted by those folks? After we had the uh, picture taken at the White House at the Christmas party of 1994, how many people are welcoming at the China with a red banner in their beer manufacturers, in their company, and they welcome me with a big party. Okay, and then they had also used their pictures with the president for their beer commercials or beer advertising, is that correct? I did not know until the campaign contribution comes up. When I was in Beijing, there's a part of street I never know I should go. I was say thank you to the CNN, show me the pictures on the TV, and that I know at that time, they used the pictures for their commercial purpose. 
And as a result of the um, business and the access that you described to us in your statement, you, you believe that is how you came to the attention of Lu Chao Ying in the summer of 1996? That's correct. Okay. And you have told us that it was in June of 1996 that you first met. June of 1996 that you first met her. Is that correct? I do not understand this question. Can okay. you I was wondering if you had first met Lu Chao Ying in June of 1996? I have to. I have to. That's correct. Okay, and I just wanted to show your um, your passport records are up on the, I believe you received a copy of the exhibits also. This is exhibit one, where it shows your passport records with you entering Hong Kong and going between Hong Kong and Macau throughout June 5th and June 8th. That's correct. Okay, and is, is that around the time when you believe you first met Lu Chao Ying? That's correct. Okay, and I would note for the record that there was also some marks in your passport where you were also in China and I believe or Hong Kong in late June also. So, okay. Ms. Comstock, just for the record, Mr. Chung has a hearing problem. He has a problem hearing in one of his ears. So okay. that's why he's having some difficulty. Okay, let me know if I need to speak up. So. Yes. Okay. okay. And as you explained, um, you brought. Lu Ying to several events in July of 1996. And I wanted to show you um, a record that it's Exhibit 2 that is a July 16th memo. And it's a memo from your company, from your general manager at that time, Irene Wu. And it indicates that you are going to take Miss Lu to a dinner at Mr. Eli Broad's house. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, this document from your company shows that under the broad dinner, it's a, it does say broad dinner, but in that we understand to be the Eli broad dinner that was held in July of 96. You were the one who was bringing Lu Chao Ying to this event, correct? That's correct. Okay, and I would just note for the record that the third, your name is listed first there, and then the third name is Miss Chao Ying Lu, Vice President China Aerospace International Holding Limited, and That's that would correct. be Miss Lu, correct? That's correct, okay. yes. And your assistant, who, Irene Wu, who drafted this document, also indicated that you would give the passport numbers for Miss Liu and another of the foreign guests, and that's on the bottom here. It says, I will give you the passport numbers for Mr. Yu and Miss Liu. Was that the normal practice that you had when you brought the foreign guests to these events? Yes. Okay, they asked you to provide the passport numbers? Yes, sometime, yes. Okay. Okay, now you told us that you had also given um, Ms. Liu your Hong Kong bank account when she had requested it at this time in this visit in July 1996, sometime during that visit, correct? That's correct. Okay, and then you also set up a company, Marswell Investments, with Ms. Liu Ying in anticipation of um, going into business with her? That's correct. Okay, and I wanted to show you, we have on the screen now, Marswell documents. Um, there was, this is exhibit three, and this is um, a certificate with your name on it, Johnny Chung, and then there is a second certificate that has uh, Miss Liu's name. It says Chow Ying Liu on it, and it shows um, both of you incorporating this Marswell Investment Company in California in 1996. That's Now, you had said when Miss Liu left the country in late July, originally she was going to be going back to Hong Kong, but she ended up going to Beijing. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, she told you that she had to see her father in Beijing. Is that correct? I asked my former general manager, Irene Wu, uh, where did she go? She said, she went straight back to Beijing. As I know, she is going back to Hong Kong. Later on, when I went back to Hong Kong, I asked her, and she said, I went, back, I went straight back to Beijing, talked to my father. Let me just... did, uh, did you know at the time, uh, Mr. Chung, that her father was the former head of the People's Liberation Army? Did you have any knowledge of that? When people, one gentleman introduced her to me, uh -huh. 
of course, she said, he said, the gentleman introduced her to me, said her father is the most high-ranking general, lead general of the army, as I know. So you, so you knew uh, when she was going back to talk to her father, she was going back to talk to somebody very high in the government who had been the head of the People's Liberation Army? I said the father and also, yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. And now on August 7th, you traveled um, back to Hong Kong with your daughter and a friend of hers? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and I wanted to show you your passport records that we have as Exhibit 4, um, show you entering Hong Kong on August 7th. Uh, okay, and then several days after you were there, you said you got it on August 11th, Miss Liu contacted you, and I want to show you your Exhibit 5 is your passport records of August 11th. And these passport records indicate that you left China on August 11th, and then you entered and departed Macau en route to Hong Kong, and then you entered Hong Kong. That's correct. Okay, now when Miss Liu called you, she said she had an important person for you to meet, and you were going to have the dinner in Hong Kong, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and does this Exhibit 5 here reflect the route that you had to travel with Miss Liu in order to get to Hong Kong? Yes. Okay. Let me ask. As I understand it, you were staying with a friend when you were there at that time, is that right? That's correct. And uh, Miss Liu uh, contacted you. How did she know where you were staying? I was, he I was there traveling. I take my daughter and her friend, put it in uh, Macau for one date. Macau is like a, a street close to the Zhuhai. And then I enter into China, Zhuhai, with my business friend. And uh, his cellular phone rings. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this was a gentleman, the name I, I was, can, I cannot talk about it here by the uh, instruction of the Department of Justice for the ongoing investigation. This gentleman's cellular phone was ringing, and he gave it to me, the port of a phone, and uh, said, Ms. Liu Taoyin call you. Well, the, the point I'm uh, trying to figure out in my mind is, did, did you tell her you were staying there? Well, she know uh, the, the day we arrived, uh, in Hong Kong, there are so many people who I took over here for that event. They all entertaining my daughters and me at the one event. So Lu Chao Ying knew where you were staying then? Yes, and okay. then she know I'm on my way to Macau in China. Okay, that, that's, that's all I need. Thank okay, you. and did Lu Chao Ying also know the person you were staying with? Personally, she knew him? Yes, ma'am. Now, you described the meeting that you had with General Xi and Lu Chao Ying. It was in the basement of a restaurant? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and when, when General Xi came in, he went through the kitchen instead of coming through a door the way you had come in? Yes, ma'am. Okay, now, could you describe General Xi to us? What are you, were you able to identify him in, in order to tell the Justice Department who he was or what he looked like? When I fully cooperate with the FBI and the Department of Justice. They show me a dozen of pictures. I, before they show me the pictures, they asked me the description of the General G, and I told them that. When they show me the pictures, within two to three seconds out of the 10 pictures, I pick it up, two of them. One is the, the pictures I know 50 some years old, one is the picture of 20, 30 some years old. And yes, I know them. I know okay. him. Okay, so you were able to pick out the pictures from the group of pictures that the FBI showed you? In two or three seconds. Okay, and, did they, and they indicated to you that you indeed had picked out General G's picture? That's correct. Now, could you just, you, you had testified, could, could you just tell us again what General G said to you at that dinner, at the conclusion? About the three hundred thousand dollars. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Oh, I'm going to say it in English first, and I'm going to use the Chinese exactly what he said to me, 
and we have the interpreter over here to translate it. At the Apolloni restaurant, he said to me, I like your president very much. We like your president very much. We would like to see him re-elect. We would like to see him we hope to see him re-elected. I will give you 300,000 US dollars. I will give you 300,000 US dollars. I'll give you 300,000 US dollars. You can give it to the president and the Democrat Party. You can give it to the president and the Democrat you can give it to your president and the uh, Democratic Party. Now, when General G said that to you, you did not make any objections about anything he said? Inside my heart, at that point, he said, he's the Mr. Xi. I said to myself, at that moment, who the hell this guy is? Who do you think you are? I didn't say it, but inside my heart, I said that. Now, when you returned home that evening, the friend that you were staying with, you told us that you asked him if he knew you know, who General G was, and he told you also that he was an important person? Yes. Liu Taoying wrote it down on a small piece of paper with a name. I showed it to my friend in Zhuhai, and he said, I asked him who he is, it's what, he, what she said who he is. And my friend told me that, yes. One of the things that was of interest to me is, is and, and this is an opinion that I want to get from you, you said, I think, in your statement that uh, uh, Lu Chaoying uh, uh, showed deference to uh, General Xi. Uh, can, can, you, can you describe how you felt that? Because it's very important uh, that, uh, that we understand uh, who was making the $300,000 contribution and who was making the decisions on how it was to be spent? Uh, to, to answer your first question, Mr. Chairman, as a businessman in the room, you will, you will know who is more important when you see who is talking and who is following the order. And I can see clearly he is the boss or he is the superior. And then, he told me that at that time, at that Apolloni restaurant, in my heart, I said to you already, I don't know who this guy is, who the hell you are, I said in my, to myself. And later on, I find it out, at this point, I still didn't receive anything yet. But you did get the clear impression, very clearly, that uh, uh, General uh, G uh, was in charge and that she was going to be the intermediary between you and General Xi. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, now I just wanted to get to those bank records. I want to show you Exhibit 6 shows, again, you meet, um, that's when you said you met with General Xi again, and again, your passport shows you leaving China. I believe you said you were in Zhuhai, and then again, entering Hong Kong, and it was at this second meeting where General G turned to Lou and told her, I will wire $300,000 to your account, and then she was to wire it to you. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and then showing you Exhibit 7 on the screen. This is your overseas trust bank account record that was provided to the committee recently. And you had said on this morning that Lu Chaoying called you and said she was putting money into your account. And I guess I would direct your attention to the third entry down where it says August, it's 14 August 96, as a transaction for um, a deposit of approximately 2.3 million Hong Kong dollars. That's correct. And my understanding is that is the equivalent of 300 thousand U.S. dollars, is that correct? 
That's correct. Okay, and prior to receiving that deposit that Lu Chao Ying had facilitated, your account showed only a balance of approximately 1,068 Hong Kong dollars, is that correct? Up there on the second line? That's correct. Okay, and that would be the equivalent of approximately 150 in U.S. dollars? That's correct. Okay, and then again, showing you another bank record that you had provided to us, Exhibit 8 again from your overseas trust bank limited account. This document is a wire transfer report which provides more detailed information on the wire and it shows the ordering customer of the wire was Lu Chao Yang. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, after Ms. Lu had wired this money, you had asked her to come over to see you that day on the 14th That's of correct. And it was on she, that she yelled at me in the early morning. Okay. And it was on that occasion that she had mentioned um, others who had been uh, receiving money, Mr. Middleton and Mr. Young. She made a. You told us that she made a reference to them. To you felt to assuage you into uh, keeping the money. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And. When she said that, she seemed to know who Mark Middleton was from when you, you had not raised his name, she raised it first? I can feel she know her. She know him, I'm sorry. Okay. And you knew Mark Middleton to be a former senior White House aide with uh, business contacts at that time in Asia? I know she used to work in the White House. I met, I met him twice in the White House when she was employed by the uh, Clinton administration. Okay. And when she mentioned a Mr. Young, a Boeing representative, she didn't give you a first name of that Mr. Young? No. Okay, and you don't know who that Mr. Young is? No, I don't. In the way we talk about it, normally in Chinese, they say Mr. Chong, Mr. Lin, or Mr. Young. Very few times you got to the first name. Okay. Now, on a separate occasion back in February 1996, you had told us that a Mr. Pai, who was a, uh, also a business associate of yours, had told you something about Charlie Tree. Could you tell us about that car ride in February 96? The gentleman of the branch manager of China construction company, the branch manager in Beijing, Mr. Bai Yang, Pai is the last name, at the one Chinese restaurant, after we finished the dinner, he drove me back to my apartment in Beijing. At one point, he said to me, do you know Mr. Char Charlie Tree? Tree Allen in Chinese, he said. I said, I do. He's a, one of the Chinese Americans like me. And do you know he's a good friend with your president? I said, yes, I know. And he asked me, do you know he asked my government for $1 million to give it to the president and Democrat party? And my eye turned into this way. I said, what? And from that point, no more further conversation. Just keep driving. OK, now you had told us you had also seen a picture in, uh, of Mr. Tree and Mr. Middleton in um, the, is it, was it the office of Mrs. Pai's business associate or some connection with Mrs. Pai's business associate? When I was down there in southern China at a city called Nanhai, when I was there in the, one of the business, uh, Mrs. businessman, Mr. He, and I went to their office I see the pictures, and I also see the company brochure with uh, Mark Middleton and Charlie Tree, and this gentleman, Mr. Hur, was on the couch and taking pictures together. Okay. And now, also returning back to when you had that dinner, that first dinner with um, Lu Chaoying and General Ji on August 11th, you had said that uh, Lu Chaoying had mentioned Charlie Tree in that meeting from her talking about Charlie Tree and saying you had a better brochure than Charlie Tree, did you have the impression that Lu Chao Ying knew Charlie Tree? She know him, in my impression.
Let me uh, <clears throat> change subjects here. You said that uh, in early 1996, you were in Beijing in the middle of the night, you got a telephone call from a Ku Baijin. Chui Bao Jian. Well, I have a little difficulty with the oh. names. And he was connected with the Great Wall International Cultural Company. And he asked you to come to a karaoke bar that night. That's correct. Okay. And then when he got the, when you got there, you were introduced to Robert Liu, the man that you thought made these overt threats to you. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at that time, was uh, was uh, Liu Chao Ying ever mentioned, or or, or uh, General Lee Liu ever mentioned? Never. Never. Now, the FBI worked with you throughout the entire process, is that correct? And they wired you so that you, they could pick up the conversations? Not only wired me, but also got a hidden camera. A hidden camera, okay. Another one of my colleagues is going to be uh, going into more detail on this subject, but I wanted to ask you about uh, ties that Mr. Liu may have had to uh, Chinese intelligence sources. Our investigators have been told that Mr. Liu failed not one, but two lie detector tests one administered by the government and another was administered independently. And the private polygraph exam indicated Mr. Liu showed deception when asked if he had ties to the PRC intelligence services. Do you know of any ties that Mr. Liu had to the PRC or uh, uh, General Xi or anybody else in the Chinese government? According to the instruction by the FBI, I posed him a lot of questions. One of the questions I asked him, do you know General Xi? I threw out the name, and he clearly showed to me he know him. I pointed out, again, under instruction of the FBI, do you know Gu Niang, which I infer to country Go, which is equal to Liu Taoyin? He said he know him. Now, he, he used a term, uh, a Chinese term about Lu Chao Ying, which indicated to you that he had to know Lu Chao Ying because that term had been used before. Is that correct? That's correct. I tried to, under the instruction of the ABI, I tried to find it out who is behind him. I had to find it out who is behind him. That's my instruction. And he came out with the Gu Niang, which is a very important word to this committee. When they say Gu Niang in Chinese, which means is a country girl. And I think nobody dared to call you Taoyin country girl. I gave her that name at the Willow Hotel in Washington. You, you gave her that I name? I gave her, her that name. So when he used the term country girl in Chinese, you knew exactly who he was talking about? Bingo. Bingo. Okay. And her connection, of course, she was a subordinate or she showed deference to General Xi, who was the head of Chinese military intelligence. That under the instruction of the API, I tried to push him. At the very end of the few meeting, I got that impression. He know him. He well, I understand that. What, that. what I'm talking about is when you first met them at the restaurant in Hong Kong, she showed deference I'm to sorry. General Xi. Yes. And, and you knew that she, he was superior to her and that she, was, she knew he was the boss. That's correct. And so when you heard Mr. Liu talking about her, and also, you were trying to find out about General Xi. You knew there was a connection there between her and the Chinese military intelligence. That's correct. Now, you mentioned a Commander Lee. Did she ever, or did, did Mr. Liu ever identify who Commander Lee was? The whole entire undercover operation, I always wanted to find who Commander Lee is. And he never told me who Commander Lee is. I didn't know who Commander Lee is. But Commander Lee was associated with a, a veiled threat that you might be in trouble if you talked, right? That in the very soft talk in Chinese, but a very hot reaction, I can feel as my life, my family life is in great dangers if I talk. Now, this is very important. The FBI concluded from the wiretap, the wire that you were wearing, that there was a definite possibility that you might be in danger. That's correct, Mr. And Chairman. they put you into a motel with your family for 21 days. On top of each other's. On top of others. Oh. Oh, he, he means oh, sort of oh, on top of each other. You were sleeping on top together. of each other in the... 
in your children. So they put you in a crowded, uh, they didn't even give you a big hotel room, huh? Oh, they tried. They tried. Right. Later on, they did. They did treat me well. I want to put it in a record. They treat me very well. But the point is, it was not just your imagination that Mr. Liu was telling you that if you talked, you might be in real jeopardy, and so would your family. And you felt like there was a strong connection back with the Chinese government. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. And the FBI concurred because they did put you in protective custody. That's correct. I think we have a couple more documents. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to put in some more information here. Is at that time, New York Times also come out. At the pre pretty much at the same time, New York Times come out with the article about Liu Chao in with that three hundred thousand dollars. And uh, all of this coming up at the same time, I think that's why we conclude myself and my family is in great dangers, and they move us in the middle of the night. I see. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to cover, just put a few more documents that you had um, addressed some of the events. In October 96, you said you had brought General G's wife and son to the Back to the Future event. I just wanted to show you exhibit number nine, which shows an invite that was, these were provided from your documents. Was that the invite for that October event with you took Mrs. G and her son Alex to? That's correct. Okay, and then exhibit 10, um, was the letter that you had discussed that um, Don Fowler wrote to Liu Xiaoying inviting her to the Democratic National Convention. Was that the letter? Did, had you asked Don Fowler to write that letter for Liu Xiaoying? I asked I asked this letter and they gave it to me. I gave it to the, Mr. Liu Xiaoying. Okay, right. and he, had, he wrote this and a number of other letters for you? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chung. Thank you, Mr. Chung. We now yield to Mr. Wax. For 30 minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was wondering if, would it be possible to have Mr. Chung take just a short break? Sure. Uh, we'll, stop. Uh, we'll stand in recess for five minutes. So Thank Mr. you. Thank you. Take a break. Is that okay? Committee will reconvene. Mr. Sun, I believe you had one little clarifying statement you wanted to make real quickly uh, regarding something that was in the testimony. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Would you yes. pull the mic over there so we can hear you, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just uh, briefly, with in connection with Mr. Chung's statement, uh, just a minor clarification. When he was discussing his um, uh, how he knew Mark Middleton, um, he indicated the name, a name that we need to clarify. The context of the statement was a f uh, where one of his uh, associates had called to ask him a favor and to call Mr. Middleton to intervene on behalf of this issue involving a Swiss bank account. The person who contacted him was an individual by the name of Liu Xu Min, L-I-U-S-H-U-M-I-N, who was a Chinese embassy official that Mr. Uh, Chung uh, had been introduced previously. So it was Mr. Liu who called Mr. Chung and asked him to call Mr. Middleton. And then the name that was actually used by Mr. Chung, Larry Liu, spelled L-I-O-U, was one of his AISI shareholders who on a separate occasion had asked Mr. Chung to call Mr. Middleton to, for a favor. So we had two Lus there, two and we needed to uh, correct the record in that regard. And, just another uh, couple of quick things. One is um, with respect to the money that came from Ms. Liu in August of 1996, um, I believe Mr. Chung indicated that the money came into his overseas trust limited account and that, just to clarify the record, a portion of the money was sent to his CalFed account in August of 1996. Um, and then uh, more money from that account was later brought over at a later time. Uh, just just to clear that up. And I believe Mr. Murphy has one other thing as well. 
Chairman, it's apparently there's a little miscommunication in the discussions regarding Charles Parrish. It wasn't Mr. Parrish's girlfriend that was brought to the event. It was Mr. He's girlfriend, and I wanted to make sure that was clear. Okay. Anything else? If not, Mr. Waxman, you're recognized for 30 minutes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chung, welcome back to uh, our committee. This is the first time you've testified in a public hearing, but it's not the first time you've appeared before members of Congress. In August of 1997, you went before members of the Senate uh, Government uh, uh, Operations Committee and uh, talked to them. And in uh, November, on November 14, 1997, you had a meeting with members of this committee and our staff. Isn't that uh, correct? That's not correct. My, my attorney talked to the Senate committee. Oh, you did not uh, talk did not, to the Senate committee? I did not come to Washington, D.C. Okay, but you did come before us. I did come before you. Okay. And, your Senate, uh, and, your, and your attorney went before the Senate committee talking to them in hopes that you might get immunity. Is that, is that your understanding? That's what I understand. Okay. During your interview with us, uh, you uh, took us through a chronology of your interactions with uh, political officials. And I want to ask you about uh, some of them. But before I get to talking to you about uh, uh, Liu Xiaoqing and General Xi, I, I want to ask you about 1995. Because I was so impressed when you met with us and you talked about your trip to China in 1995, where you were uh, talking to Chinese uh, government officials about uh, releasing Harry Wu, who was a uh, political uh, prisoner. You spoke with it real passion. You felt Mr. Uh, uh, Wu was being held improperly and illegally. And I'd like you to share your views uh, with us, uh, uh, share it with us your experiences uh, about uh, dealing with Mr. Harry Wu. <clears throat> On the late June 1995, one gentleman called Mr. Charles Parrish, who we know who he is, he called me from the Wulumuchi, Xinjiang province of China. And he called me at my office. I asked him, why you go there? It's a small countryside. And he said, well, I'm here for purpose. And uh, well, I thought you have some friend. He indicated the friend who I indeed take them to the March 1995 presidential radio address, Mr. Sun. I asked Mr. Sun to go to the hotel, give him the basket of fruit and the flower. Ended up with Mr. Sun was followed by the Chinese policeman. Two days later, I saw, I watching the CNN breakout, I saw Mrs. Wu, Harry Wu's wife, was crying out at the Capitol Hill. I said to my wife, I hope I can do something about it. Would you cry out if I was arrested by someone overseas? She said, I will do the same thing. I feel sympathy about that. The first one I counted, and then the California Democrat Chairman Bill Press, a co-host of the Crossfire today. I raised my issue to Mr. Bill Press. I talked to him. He helped me out to get through with the Chairman Don Fallo. And I talked to Don Fallo about Harry Wu issue. Then, the reason why Mr. Charles Parrish was in Ulumuchi, Xinjiang, he was ordered by the State Department looking after Mr. Wu. Mr. Well, Chang, uh, let me interrupt you. Rather than going through every detail, what you said to us, as I recall, was that you talked to a, a man in um, in China, uh, who was equivalent to the head of the President's National Security Council, and made an appeal to him to have Harry Wu released, and that you felt, and never got the credit, but you felt that you deserved the credit for Harry Wu 
uh, getting out of uh, Chinese prison. Is that is that accurate? I never asked the credit for the release of Harry Wu, but I did what I think is the right thing to do as an American citizen. Well, do you think you played an important role in getting him released? At that time, I did ask all of those Chinese business connections what I can do. And I did meet with the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, Liu Huachiu, and the gentleman, Mr. Liu, who I know from the TV, Chinese news now. He's the second person in the Chinese embassy right now in Washington, D.C. You remember calling uh, the Democratic National Committee and telling them that you were responsible for getting Harry Wu out? I remember I talked to several people in the National Democrat Committee. I will go, I will try to release him, and I sh they show me the support. Well, uh, a Carol Kahir was quoted in an LA Times article as saying that you told her you'd managed to get Harry Wu out of jail and you were very pleased with yourself. The moment I had the meeting over with the minister, the vice minister, Li Hua Chu of the foreign, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, that night, that afternoon, I came back to my hotel room. I make a several phone call. I told them, Carol K. I told the secretary to be appraised. I also talked to the person back there, Muriel. I now I remember the name because one of the U.S. investigators told me. She was the uh, volunteer working at the White House First Lady's office. I told them that at the end of the conversation at that dinner, the Chinese told me, the vice minister told me, if you maintain, which is the United States, maintain one China policy, and you will not give the president of, Ch president of Taiwan, Li Denghui, another visa, and ask me if the first lady come into the con woman conference in Beijing, and pretty much, you, pretty soon we will release, we will do something. And that's all I know. I give pass on all of this information to whatever I can. I did try to call the president's office at the White House, Betty Curry, and it sounds like nobody answered the phone at that time. Later on, I figured out the president was on the birthday vacation in Wyoming or Montana. Did you call, uh, the, were you trying to call the White House to tell them that you had arranged to get Harry Wu out of prison? There's few people at the First Lady's office, they know that. Okay, and I ask, did... Let me ask you another question. You, you, yeah. you, there's some people you called and, and were, you were pretty excited because you thought he was going to get out and in fact, 10 days later, he did get out. Mr. Congressman, we are talking about two different phone calls. One is this is the event after the conversation and the other phone call is when I was in Shanghai, the day Harry Wu was released. Right. Now, Ms. Kahir at the DNC claimed that you called and said you were responsible for getting Harry Wu out. That was the second phone call. Okay. I called him up when I was in Shanghai, the same day Harry Wu was released. When you met with us two years later in 1997, you told us explicitly, you never publicly took the credit, but you told us that you felt you were responsible in getting Harry Wu out. And at that time, I did whatever I can at my own expense. Well, I'm not, I'm not uh, in any way criticizing you. My own you. time. You tried, you tried to do what was a good thing. You tried to get this man out of prison, and I commend you for that. But when you met with us, you said, and it's because of me that Harry Wu was out. Now, do you know this gentleman sitting to my, to my right, Mr. Lantos? Yes, I do. Do you remember what he said to you at that meeting? I don't take a note. I'm sorry. Would you remind me? You don't recall what he said to you? You don't? I'm sorry, Mr. Lando. The only thing I remember you, you asked me to speak louder. Well, <laughs> he also said something else. He said to you that he thought it was absolutely preposterous 
that you would think that you were responsible for getting Harry Wu out of prison in China, since so many of the uh, congressmen, senators, human rights groups, people at the highest levels of diplomatic channels were trying to get him out. He thought it was preposterous. But it was clear that you, at that time, genuinely believe you were responsible for Harry Wu's release. Now, it's interesting to me that the conversation, which I thought was a pretty harsh one, from Mr. Lantos in 1997, you can't remember, but the conversations you had uh, in 1996, you seem to remember in a great deal of detail. Let me ask you about another matter. There were 20 people in that meeting room, Mr. May, Wax. Well, there was one person, Mr. Lantos, who, who took I, I would like to responsible sure, to this question. Sure, he took after you, and it seems to me you should be able to remember when somebody attacks you. There's so many people in that room at the first time for me to come to the Congress. And so many people jump up a question another one. And so many people there in that room. And sometimes I didn't really pick it up. Well, how many questions asked me simultaneously? So you didn't recall? That's what might react to you. Let me uh, get a clarification. You I will remember you yeah. asked me the question today, because this is a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, well, that was one-on-one, -on -one too. But in 1997, you, you said you did not meet with the Senate, uh, but you did meet with the Senate staff in Los Angeles, didn't you? I'm sorry, you, you were asking him... Whether he met with Senate staffers in 1997, August 1997. He may have may introduced to a couple of staffers, but he didn't actually meet or talk with them beyond that. Well, that's very peculiar, because I have notes from the Senate staffers of the meeting. Was it only with you, Mr. Sun? Yes, we, there was a meeting in my office, Mr. Wax, and Mr. Chung was present. We did an attorney proffer. Mr. Chung was there to sort of correct and clarify anything that the attorneys might have said or incorrectly or, uh, you know, that might have been from his standpoint. Well, I consider that an interview with him, and there were statements by him at that meeting. Were not there not? Well, I don't want to, I don't think we need to get into a semantic discussion about it. Mr. Chung was present in my office when some of those discussions took place. He wasn't present for all of them. Let's, let's, uh, I, I have these notes and we'll go over it later. Hazel O'Leary. Mr. Chung, you gave a television interview to NBC News in August 1997. This interview made headlines across the country because you alleged Energy Secretary Hazel O'Leary insisted on a contribution before scheduling a meeting with you and some Chinese guests. Uh, because of your statement, the Attorney General of the United States launched an investigation of Secretary O'Leary. This committee investigated your allegations and actually deposed Ms. O'Leary in the process. She had her reputation brought into question. She had to bear a large financial toll, both in terms of attorney's fees and opportunity costs. Uh, do you know what both the Attorney General's investigation and our investigations concluded? And I want to read to you what, uh, what the Attorney, Attorney General said. She said, there is nothing about the substance of the meeting that suggests that there was anything inappropriate about the meeting. The investigation developed no evidence that Mrs. O'Leary had anything to do with the solicitation of the charitable donation. In fact, Attorney General Reno further stated, Mr. Chung's belief that Ms. O'Leary knew about the solicitation amounts to little more than speculation. Now, would you give that same answer that you gave to Mr. Brokaw if it were asked again, and that question was, um, uh, whether uh, whether you had to give money uh, and uh, as a requirement to meet with her? I only talk to the government what the fact is. And what they want to do with that fact is out of my control. Uh, I want to ask you about another subject you discussed in an interview with NBC News, and this dealt with Maggie Williams, who was the f uh, chief of staff to the First Lady. Uh, you said uh, there was a uh, a check for $50,000 made out to the DNC, and you delivered it to Ms. Williams. Uh, there's nothing illegal about this, but you went also on to say that um, she and uh, other White House staff actively solicited the contribution. 
the distinction is important because if she act, actually solicited the contributions, it's illegal. If she received it and then passed it on to the appropriate party, it's not illegal. So Tom Brokaw recognized this critical distinction, and in his, in his interview, he said, quote, but who suggested the donation? That's the critical point because it, it's against law, the law for federal employees to solicit donations. Your answer was that Maggie Williams and her assistant, Evan Ryan, solicited the contribution. As Tom Brokaw reported, Chung insists Mrs. Clinton's aides, Evan Ryan and Maggie Williams, raised the idea of a donation to the very cost of a White House Christmas party. Do you remember that exchange with Tom Brokaw? I told the fact to Tom Brokaw. I told the fact to the government investigator. Well, as a result of that allegation, both this committee and the Senate Government Affairs Committee investigated Ms. Williams. She was deposed by this committee for over 10 hours. She then testified at a public committee hearing for nearly five hours. She spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on attorney's fees. Neither committee found uh, any support for your allegation. And when you met with us in November 1997, you no longer insisted that Maggie Williams solicited the money from you. Instead, you said the discussion preceding the delivery of the check were with Evan Ryan, not Maggie Williams, and you conceded that the idea of making the contribution may have originated with you. Um, can you appreciate the harm you've caused to both Ms. O'Leary and Ms. Williams through these erroneous allegations? I told the fact to the investigator of the government and what they want to do with it. If you want to ask me one more time, Mr. Congressman, I'd be very happy to give you the detail minute by minute. Well, you told your statements, but they were inconsistent. And you said at one point that they solicited, but then later backed away. That's a significant point. I want to return to your statements to, in 1997 to both the Senate and the House committees. When you appeared before the committees, did you understand that it was a federal crime under 18 U.S.C. Section 1001 to provide false information to Congress? I told the Congress the fact at that time at the advice of my attorney. And did you understand that it was important to tell the truth and that it could be a crime not to tell the truth to members of staff and members of Congress? I told the truth at the advice of my counsel. I want to review some of At the of same time, I, Mr. Congressman, I'd like to talk to you okay. about, I was, uh, my attorney was under negotiation with the, Mr. Chuck LaBella at that time. I want to review some of your statements and ask whether you stand by those answers. Uh, in your interview with the Senate, you had an opportunity to review, uh, your, your attorney has reviewed the notes from the Senate meeting and he indicated in a letter that was correct. Your attorney said, quote, Chung could deflate the foreign source issue by proving that he made his donations entirely out of his own money. Do you still stand by that statement? You made the contributions out of your own money? I do. I do. Okay. Um, your attorney also said Mr. Chung had not been a conduit for foreign money. The funds he donated were the ones over which he had total control. Do you stand by that statement? I think you said it as well in your... That is my statement. Mr. Sun, as your attorney gave an interview, and he denied that Be the Beijing government was trying to use you as an agent. Do you stand by that statement? At, at, the, at the time, yes, I do. When you met with this committee in November 97, I do. you told I'm us sorry. essentially the same thing. You said you'd received no money from foreign governments. you stand by that statement? Excuse me, Congressman, when do you attribute that statement? This is being November made? 1997. And this was the meeting, excuse me, this was the meeting where um, members of this committee and staff agreed that this was an off-the-record interview. We had taken the Fifth Amendment because of the pendency of a criminal investigation. I did about 70 percent of the talking, as I recall, during that meeting. And, but I reminded both the members of this committee and the staff that where it was a pending Department of Justice criminal investigation. There were certain matters that we could not get into because of that investigation, and I want to make that clear for the record. And you're referring to notes, notes that I would note for the record that I have not seen, um, that as That's I understand correct. it were now, provided Sun, to the Department Sun, of Justice. I only have a, only have a limited amount of time. Them. Let me stipulate, this was a meeting. 
that you're referring to, and these were notes that I took and my staff took and other, uh, they were all uh, put together and all uh, uh, corroborated by each other. Now, the notes you had from the Senate meeting, you did get a chance to review. You did not get to see these. But you, Mr. Uh, Sun, said, Senator Specter's suggestion that Chung's money was from foreign sources was not accurate. Mr. Chung, do you still hold that the money you received was not from, that any st statement that your money was from foreign sources was not accurate? In the context of the donations or money that he received, Congressman, that's a clarification I would seek. Because Mr. Chung in his statement has said he received a lot of money from foreign sources. Yes. What he disputes is the notion, I think, raised by Senator Specter that, that all these donations were earmarked and that Mr. Chung was a conduit for these foreign right. source donations. That's the point. I just so, want to clarify So you that. stand by that statement that uh, the, the sources may have been foreign sources, but the contributions were from Mr. Chung? That's correct. Okay. Um, a very important issue is what General G said to you, and I'm confused about this because your statement seems so unclear. On page 23, you say that, quote, I want to emphasize that except for the general, no one told me to give money to the Democrats, end quote. This seems to apply the General G told you to give money. But I don't see from your testimony where General G told you to give money to Democrats. Let me go to page 17 and 18 of your testimony. There you describe the f in four sentences the General G, what General G told you. I want to go through each of these sentences. He said, one, we really like your president. Is this a directive? for you to give money to the president? That's the way he told me he liked our, your president. Okay, that's all he meant. The first full sentence is, I like your president. I like your, we like your president. Okay, the second sentence, we hope he will be reelected. Is that, was that a directive for you to give money to the president? That's the way he feel he liked. He liked see. him. He liked, or we, they liked to see okay. he been reelected. And then he said, I will give you 300,000 US dollars what about this statement? Was that a directive to you to give that money to the president? That the way. Uh, I think he's having trouble with the word directive. Was he ordering you? Did he simply say you can give the money, or said you had to give that money? He will give me the money. He will give you money. Yes. And you what can give it to the president. Did that mean you had to give it to the president, or was it your money? It's my money. It's my money. At that conversation, I told you that I don't know this guy who the hell is. He called himself Mr. Xi. Yeah, why were you so insulted at that? What, what, what offended you about that statement? Why were you angry about it? I've been talked to these four sentences to more than 50, 60 times. The sentence is there. Just and why? No, I'm not. He was telling you how to use the money? That's the impression I get it from him. But you felt it was your money. I feel the promise from Liu Chaoyin it no, makes no difference with the other businessmen but me. Um, if you see my pattern all, the, all, all along with the two years. Mm -hmm. Well, he's telling you you can make a contribution. He's not saying you shall make a contribution. And mo moreover, you, you, you have later in your testimony um, two other facts that seem to be unclear to me. First, on page 21, you say that Ms. Liu said you could use the money for your business. Why would Ms. Liu contradict an express directive from General G? Speculated. You're speculating? No, I think he's trying to say, Congressman, he doesn't know what she was thinking in that regard. Yeah. He well, she said you can use the money for your own, for our business, didn't she? Yes, that's what she told me at the Willow Hotel. She told you, it was after the conversation with General G. Yes, she... General she, G said, here's $300,000. Did he say, I want you to use all of it for the Democrats and President Clinton? He didn't say, he didn't. He only said you can give 
or we use to the president and the Democrat Party. Okay. Uh, you got to translate it over here to, to translate. Yeah, I've heard the I, translation. If somebody says you can use the money for the president's reelection, and he knew you were already giving a lot of money to the president for his reelection, and he knew that some of the foreign money you received you used for contributions, um, didn't that simply acknowledge that you were going to give some of that money? In my statement, you can also see that. I was encouraged by Liu Chao and he told, them, told him that how disappointed I am with the business of the relationship back there in Beijing early on. And later on, she said you can, she also indicated to him about how loyalty I am to the Democrat Party, how loyalty I am to the President of the United States. And uh, in, a, in a sense, I always talk to everybody I met, more money I, I make more money I can get. Not only talk to the uh, investor or shareholders, but also I talk to, the, talk to the DNC and White House official. So in fact, you thought of it as your money, you used that money to pay your taxes, you used it to pay your mortgage, you used it even to pay the salary of General G's son, who worked for you, and you, you, and you donated, now the Senate says $20,000 of the $300,000, you've been saying $35,000 of it to the Democratic Committee or President Clinton. Is that right? I stay with that the money I receive. It's my money. I can use it whatever way I want to use it. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't maintain in any way that the President or the Democratic Party knew that money was coming from General G. You didn't tell them that, did you? No, I don't. Well, it, it's, it strikes me that one theory in all this is uh, the kind of theory that the chairman outlined, how all of this is part of a conspiracy. But it seems to me a very strange conspiracy if the, if the um, Chinese um, government is telling you uh, to give uh, $300,000 through General, General G's comments, to give $300,000 to the Democratic Party, but he doesn't care whether the Democratic Party or the president knows it was his money. He doesn't seem to care that you only gave $20,000 of it, not $300,000 of it, to the president. Um, if, if that's the way they've run their conspiracy, it seems to me a very strange notion of a China plan to uh, re-elect the president. You think it's part of a broad conspiracy? As my statement, I said, the people who I deal with it. It seems like uh, I if think we have a conspiracy, it's point. being constructed, it has to be constructed on three legs. The first leg is that you were a conduit for foreign contributions. But you told us in 1997 and again today, you were never a conduit for foreign contributions. Your testimony is that you had control over the money you received and were not directed to give the money to the DNC. So that's the first leg. That so that uh, doesn't stand. I always maintain whatever time, how much, and when to go, I make this decision by myself. It's your decision because it's your money. It's decide. my money. Second leg is you receive the money from the Chinese government as part of a plot to influ influence U.S. elections. But in 1997 and again today, you said you never received the money from a foreign government. Is that accurate? I consider the money I received, as you talk about the Italians' money. It will be the same thing that you tell You don't know whether it came from the Chinese government or from her businesses. A statement over here is when she, when Jano Ji said to Liu Tao Yin, my, my statement to you, I don't know the source be, behind it. And the third leg would have to be that you're just one piece of a comprehensive scheme by the Chinese government to funnel money into the American political statement. Now, you made statements regarding Mr. Middleton, Mr. Young, Mr. Tree to demonstrate this scheme, but you have no knowledge about the actual facts about those three individuals. You're passing on something you heard about them, is that right? That's a second-hand second -hand information, I know. In fact, while we couldn't corroborate a lot of what you told us because it's stuff you heard and we couldn't check it out, we were able to check out about Mark Middleton. And Mark Middleton uh, s flatly denied the statement that it was attributed to you in the press. Uh, he said that in November, um, that 
that Mark Middleton, Miss Liu, you said Miss Liu told you that Mark Middleton received five hundred thousand dollars from Mr. Wong of the Singapore Group to help China, and uh, we checked to see Excuse whether me, Mr. that Chairman, was hearsay. It's our understanding that Mark Middleton Mr. has taken uh, the fifth, and he hasn't testified as to anything. I think this is Mr. a mischaracterization Chairman, is, uh, of testimony. This is my time, and Mr. Middleton. Well, that doesn't mean you can mischaracterize testimony in Mr. legal General, proceedings, General, Mr. Waxman. Of order, Mr. Chairman, well, the gentleman will state his point of order. It's my time, and point, let him act. Point of order is, I believe that the gentleman no, from California has mischaracterized testimony. Would the, would the chairman clarify whether or not Mark Middleton has taken the fifth and has, in fact, not testified as to any of this? Uh, well, was it the... Was it the Mr. Was chairman, it, was it I Mr. have a letter it, in my hand. Was it Mr. Hand. Middleton's attorney that Mr. made the I statement, a, or Middleton? I have a letter from Mr. Middleton's attorney, and in it he says, as counsel for Mark Middleton, I'm writing to respond to the, your request this is to Ms. Comstock, of May 6th that Mr. Middleton agreed to be interviewed by the committee about the disgraceful and false accusations that the committee has been leaking to the media over the last several days. And he goes on to say that he, uh, he did not receive the money. In fact, we were able to check through your uh, staff Mr. that, uh, uh, that there's, money there's received. One, I'll, I'll give you additional time, but, okay. the, but the fact is Mr. Middleton has still taken the fifth, and this letter was from his attorney. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank I appreciate that proper characterization and if I, and if of the I might testimony, just have another, despite uh, the effort to mischaracterize it by the gentleman put, uh, from California. Two, well, there's no effort to mischaracterize anything. Uh, Mr. Sun has been two, able put to... Put two more minutes on the clock for the gentleman from California. Mr. Sun has been able to speak in the name of Mr. Chung, his client, and Mr. Middleton's attorney is able to speak for him. And, in fact, uh, the uh, D Department of Justice concluded uh, that uh, Mr. Middleton agreed to... Call in, well, this letter says... Mr. Middleton agreed to cooperate fully with the Department of Justice in its investigation. He was thoroughly interviewed. The Justice Department concluded that the allegations of Mr. Middleton ever received any funds from sources in the People's Republic of China were without foundation. My point is that what we have are these statements. There was a statement about Ambrose Young, and then I believe Mr. Sun said, well, maybe it wasn't the right uh, Mr. Young. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot of hearsay, a lot of statements that are made, a lot of speculation with reputations that can be ruined as a result of the speculation, just as a great deal of harm was done to Hazel O'Leary and Maggie Williams and Ambrose Young, who's, by the way, a big uh, Republican contributor. Uh, it seems to me that if this is part of a case, uh, we ought to look at actual facts. And we don't have actual facts to back up all of this. I think there's a lesson to be learned from all this, and I think a lot of it's a tribute to you, Mr. Uh, Chung. You came here as an immigrant. You worked hard as a busboy at the Holiday Inn. You became an American citizen. You had 18 computer stores. You went out and uh, made $3 million be between 1994 and 1996. At some point, you discovered that if you contribute money to politicians, you get pampered by them. You get access to them. This is uh, not unique to the Democratic Party. It's also part of what the Republicans do. It's part of this corrupting campaign finance system that we have. And in getting this access, you took photos. And with these photos, you impressed a lot of people that you were an insider, a player. And that meant more business came to you. Uh, and uh, that money uh, came from foreign businessmen who wanted to do business with you because they thought you were an important person in the United States. That seems to what be what impressed uh, Ms. Liu and General G. Isn't that a correct assumption? Yes. To answer your question, for two things, government, Department of Justice, and the FBI find me as a very credible witness. And the other issue is, in my statement to you, Mr. Waxman, this is a system I didn't create it. Sure. You guys doesn't like it, change it. You're absolutely right. Don't shout it to each other, let's change it. Isn't it possible that General G and Liu Xiaodeng gave you that money because they wanted to impress you because you were an important person in the United States? They wanted to go into business with you, they wanted to impress you, they wanted you to be helpful to them in their business operations. Yes, I do. I think so. I want to do business with people around you, too, because you're important, too. Well, I, I, uh, I think it's, it, it's, uh, your experience is helpful in illustrating not international intrigue, but how defective our system is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Before we uh, I yield to Mr. Latourette, uh, yesterday Mr. Waxman and I received responses to interrogatories and subpoenas directed to Mr. Ambrose Young. We wanted to clear up whether the Hong Kong Boeing representative mentioned by Liu Chaoying might have been Ambrose Young. I ask unanimous consent that Mr. Young's responses be included in the record. These responses make it very clear that Mr. Ambrose Young could not possibly have been the individual in question, and uh, I'm surprised that Mr. Waxman might mention this, knowing that uh, he would unfairly be slandering Mr. Young because oh, we got that reserve, yesterday. Reserving the right to object. I only mention it for the purpose of showing how careless, reckless accusations can be made as they were by Mr. Chung in the meeting he had with our staffs, which turned out to be inaccurate as it related to Mr. Uh, Chung. I understand. As have other statements that have been made by Mr. Chung turned out to be inaccurate. They are harmful, and there's, it seems to me, a pattern of misunderstandings and speculations that Mr. Chung is quick to, uh, to say to the press, and it turns out often later that they're without any factual basis. I understand. I have no objection to the request. Mi I think it ought to be in the Thank record. You. Mi Mi Mr. Mr. Chung, Chairman, I, I think Mi Mr. that... Mr. Chung never said it was Ambrose Young, number one. And number two, Mr. Ambrose Young did cooperate with our interrogatories, as you well know. And we were, when you were talking about Mr. Middleton, he has taken the fifth and not cooperated with this committee. Did you have a comment? Just briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, we agree with Mr. Waxman that there have been uh, times and instances where uh, things might be taken out of context or extrapolated. I think this has happened to Mr. Chung on a number of occasions where he was attributed to having participated in events or contacts with people such as Secretary Dalton of the Navy or the Costco matter that he had nothing to do with. So there are instances when that sort of thing happens where people, whether it's the media or whether some members of this committee or somebody wants to spin something out of control. Uh, Mr. Chung does have some language uh, uh, barrier issues that he's trying to struggle with in understanding some of the questions here today. We talked about that during the break. I think he wanted me to say that, that he's trying to cooperate with the members of this committee. He's not trying to say anything more than what was told him in these meetings. He's not trying to spin it into whether this was some nefarious scheme or not. He's just here to tell you what happened to him. Nothing more, nothing less. Thank you. Mr. LaTourette. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chung, I, I want to talk to you today about uh, a fellow who you mentioned in your testimony, Charles Parrish, from the, uh, the U.S. Embassy in China. Before I do that, just three things occurred to me as a result of some recent exchanges. I, I, I think I, for one, and other members of the committee would love to hear from Mr. Middleton in the future if he wanted to, to chat about what it is you've had to say in your testimony today. Two, I was more than interested in the observations about perjury and, and lying under oath before Congress because perjury and, and lying under oath have sort of received a, a new brush up um, in the recent months uh, to those of us who have spent our time in law enforcement before coming into Congress. And third, your testimony reminded me that nothing good ever happens at a karaoke bar, I will tell you that. I, um, Charles Parrish, uh, who you talked about, uh, my understanding is that Mr. Parrish was uh, em employed in the, uh, our embassy in Beijing from 1994 to 1996 that uh, the, our ambassador, who's recently been in the news, Ambassador Sasser, actually asked for him to be recalled uh, amid allegations that he was uh, engaged in a, a pattern of handing out visas, uh, permits to visit the United States under some suspicious uh, circumstances. In fact, it's my understanding that his office was sealed, and um, in interviews at least, Mr. Parrish has reported that he came back home expecting the worst, that he was going to be investigated. A little earlier, in reference to Mr. Middleton, there were references to complete investigations by the Department of Justice, and I think that, that uh, Mr. Parrish was expecting the same. Surprisingly, he came back and, and uh, again, rather than being uh, investigated or given maybe the Canada desk or uh, a desk that doesn't propose a, a security threat to the United States, it's my understanding he spent some time uh, reviewing security clearances for individuals from Iraq and Iran uh, that wanted to visit the United States. Uh, and recently he's retired in 1998 uh, in response to some questions that were asked uh, relative to a fundraiser that I believe you and he attended in California uh, in 1995. I, I want to talk to you, first of all, about visas. Uh, I think that people in this country take for granted that, that visas to other countries are, are pretty freely given, um, except apparently when the investigators from this committee wanted to go to China to ask questions about campaign finance reform. I, is it your experience that visas granted um, to, for Chinese nationals to visit the United States of America are as freely given? Is that an easy process? Very difficult. 
And I think you mentioned during your written statement and also your testimony that after you became acquainted with Mr. Parrish, you in fact took dozens of people to Mr. Parrish uh, to assist you in getting visas to the United States of America. Is that an, an accurate That's observation? That's correct. How many dozens of people would you say that was? A little bit more than 2,000, I believe. More than 2,000 people? No, 2,000. Between 25 to 30 people. Oh, 25, uh, two dozen, I'm sorry. 25 to 30 people. And was the purpose of obtaining the visas for most of those people, were they business associates that were coming hoping to conduct business in the United States? Yes, that it was those people who come over here to visit, including the most famous uh, March 1995 radio address. And did any of the individuals, this 25 to 30 individuals with whom you dealt with Mr. Parrish to get a visa to visit the United States, did they wind up attending uh, political functions uh, of either party in the 1995-1996 section? Not all of them, but some of them. How many of the some of them? Can... If you know, if you don't know, that's... I, I, I didn't calculate. I'm sorry, Mr. Congressman. We'd be happy to provide that to the committee, if you'd like, at a subsequent time. We are talking about four years ago. Sure. Did they attend those functions as your guest? Yes. And did you pay their way, or did they make contributions to be accepted at these political fundraisers, I assume we're talking I about? I paid the way for them. And, and were the uh, political fundraising activities limited to one political party or another? W was it all Republicans or all Democrats fundraisers that you went uh, to? They're all Democrat fundraisers. Were they all associated with the president's re-election campaign of 1996? Or were there other events? To answer the question is, they're all the president was there. That's why I go. Now, in your testimony, you indicated that you first met Mr. Parrish when, because the, the head of the uh, Howellman uh, Beer Company had a visa problem. Is that right? Uh, I, no, I think it, he had the visa, one, en one entry visa first. He attended by himself. To do it. Before he meet with me here in Washington D.C., and he, he tried to get the second multiple entry visa, I tried to help him out. And, and but is that when you met Mr. Parrish for the first time, when you went to try and help Mr. He get a multiple entry visa? That's what. That's I mean. correct. And and how is it that you came to meet Mr. Parrish? Did you, did you walk into the embassy and I need to see the head guy in charge, or were you directed to see Mr. Parrish? Uh, I was the, I was in uh, in China first time on August 28, 1994. Uh, I was there, and I had the chance to meet with the commercial attaché of the U.S. Embassy. I don't remember the gentleman's name, who worked in at the commercial division. I suddenly called him up, and I asked him, is there any way he can help one of my business associates who I want to do business with, but that would indicate how many beer. If you can uh, help me out to get this gentleman uh, to get a proper way to get a visa, and he introduced Charles Parrish to me at the commercial section okay. of and, embassy. And, and after that time, you and Mr. Mr. Parrish at least had a number of conversations. You took a number of people to him relative to visa applications to the United States. Is that that's correct? All right. You indicated in your opening statement that at one point Mr. Parrish approached you uh, and asked if you could assist in computer getting a computer tutor for his secretary at the United States Embassy. Is that right? Uh, yes, that is. Uh, He's the secretary in the embassy, and I have the uh, temporary office it, at the Beijing. And then uh, they came to my office for tutoring on the computer, yes. And you paid for the expense of that tutor, and it was about $500, is that right? Yeah, 500 US dollars, but in, right, 500 in, in Chinese currency. Okay. You also indicated that Mr. Parrish came to you and, and wanted you to pay some school expenses for seven students, and you did that to the tune of seven or $8,000, is that correct? That's correct. I get a copy to the FBI already for the casual check. Is there any question in your mind that Mr. Parrish knew that you were, uh, in fact, f that there was going to be an expense involved with the students' training and also the computer tutor? Somebody had to be paying the bill, is that right? That's correct. And, and was that discussed between you and Mr. Parrish? I mean, is there any question in your mind that he knew that it was you that were pay was paying the bill? He knew I'm paying the bill. And at, during this time, while you're paying for student expenses for seven students that he brings to you and a computer tutor to train on a computer, uh, you're still going to him to try and get your friends and business associates admitted through the visa process to the United States of America, and he is granting 25 or 30 of those. Is that right? That's correct. 
I want to talk to you a little bit about Mr. He and the Howellman Beer Company uh, for a minute. During your testimony, you made a correction uh, about this grocery bag of money. I think your te written testimony said on at least one occasion you witnessed this, then you went back. Was it only one occasion that you saw a grocery bag of money with 10 Chinese passports delivered by, Mr., uh, by, by you to Mr. Parrish? Was that just one time? That, oh. <clears throat> that was a late night, and the one... Uh, at my apartment at, at Beijing. Mr. He and one of his associates came into my apartment, which we, I, I and Mr. Parrish have the dinner together. And then they was in my apartment, and somebody knocked the door. Well, here comes Mr. He and one associate with a shopping bag. And in the shopping bag, is my understanding, is cash and, and also some uh, passports of Chinese nationals. I said to the government, it's uh, Chinese money, one bundle and a half. OK. Uh, but, but it's still, it's, it's money and Chinese national passports, is that that's right? That's correct. And Mr. He asked you if you would take it to Mr. Uh, Parrish for the purpose of obtaining visas for these individuals uh, to enter the United States of America, is that right? Didn't, didn't see that kind of question, but the impression is that he gave it to me, I opened it up, I said, I don't want to do anything with it, I hand it over to Mr. Parrish. That was all okay, you, But you gave the shopping bag full of money and the passports to Mr. Parrish, is that, that was right? Through this way. I, I say I don't want to do anything with that. Okay. Is the Howman Beer Company a state-owned and, and operated beer company? Is, is it run by the Chinese government, a shareholder of the communist Chinese government? Mr. Congressman, up to today, I still want to find it out. Is it state-owned or private-owned? Because I, what I know is that it's sold to the French company. Okay. And after the, that, that picture on uh, Christmas uh, White House, an advertisement on the street of Beijing, right. and make them sell to French company very well. Right. And is what you're saying is that the Howman Beer Company, to promote beer sales, was putting up a, a picture of Mr. He and the President and the First Lady of the United States saying, drink Howman beer because I'm here with the President and the First Lady of the United States. Is that what the advertisement looked like? I didn't see it, but I, I see it from CNN. It's a picture there with the two giant bottle of beer. That's what I see. I didn't see it exactly. Okay. You also had the opportunity to take Mr. Parrish to a, a fundraising event in, they called the Southern California Presidential Gala on September the 21st, 1995, did you not? That's correct. Uh, and I, if we have the technology, there, you faxed a letter to someone named Karen Sternfeld of Clinton Gore 96, uh, indicating that uh, you were going to have a, a group of people that you were bringing um, to this function. Is that, you recognize this fax? Do you have the date of that letter, Congressman? It's a September 19, 1995 fax from AISI to uh, Karen Sternfeld. I've seen, I seen this one before, yes. Okay. Well, uh, regardless, uh, table two, uh, guest number eight is Mr. Charles Parrish. And you took Mr. Charles Parrish, a Foreign Service officer, uh, to a Clinton Gore 96 event on September the 21st, 1995. That's correct. You also took him on a tour of the White House and the First Lady's office, is that right? That's correct. Can you explain to the the committee why it is you took a, an employee of the United States State Department, a foreign service officer charged with issuing visas uh, to permit Chinese nationals into the United States of America to a, a, a presidential campaign event in 1995? How did that happen? Well, I, in the one way, it's, it's a party. I want everybody to be there, and then I want to say thank you to the gentleman who've been helping my uh, business associate to come to the United States and uh, to impress him, too. And you eventually stopped having dealings with Mr. Parrish after the shopping bag full of money incident when you determined, though, that perhaps he and Mr. He were up to things that you didn't want to be a part of. Is that, is that right? I, I don't, you you I, stopped doing business with Mr. Parrish in, in late 1995 they, because they, you didn't like the, the way the thing smelled or looked. Is that a fair that, observation? That's correct. Thank you very much, Mr. Chung. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Latourette. We will be... Uh, revisiting the parish issue in the future. Mr. Lantos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chung, we have been spending over three hours on you. I'd like to spend a few minutes I have on China because I think the subject is a bit more interesting. Um, you have had your 15 minutes of fame, and it's sort of obvious that you are a very minor and insignificant puppet in a vast global drama orchestrated by the communist regime in Beijing. 
this drama is played on multiple stages simultaneously. It's a ten-ring circus, and you are just a tiny sideshow. So let me deal with the, the main issue. It's obvious that Communist China is using whatever mechanism is at its disposal to advance its interests. And your small part in it fits into the picture perfectly. I'm sorry, Mr. Lantos, I have the same problem with you with the yielding, uh, I mean, yielding problem, I'm sorry. I will come yeah, Thank closer. you very much. I will come closer. Occasionally, the Chinese engage in a charm offensive, and occasionally they engage in a fury offensive. Six years ago, they were engaged in a charm offensive when they were trying to get the 2000 Olympics for Beijing. I introduced the resolution opposing that, which uh, the, the House passed on July 26. Um, overwhelmingly by a vote of 287 to 99. Imagine how bad it would be if we would now be looking at the prospect of holding the year 2000 Olympics in Beijing, where the United States Embassy has been treated so abominably in the last few days. We occasionally go through a fury phase. We are in one of those fury phases. It, of course, to a very large extent, is a phony fury. The Beijing leadership did not show much empathy for the deliberately killed hundreds of Chinese citizens at Tiananmen Square, whom this regime killed. But the regime is suddenly profoundly exercised over the accidental killing, which we all regret of four Chinese citizens in Belgrade. So I think it's important to keep our eyes on the ball. This ruthless communist dictatorship is using all the means at its disposal, military, economic, political, cultural, financial, you, you name it, to advance its interests. And you, with your financial dealings, were a tiny part of a very complex mosaic. And while, you know, some may be fascinated by the nuances of what you did, what you didn't, some of us are more interested in, in the broad picture. Now, it seems to me you have testified that no one in the administration knew that any of the funds that you provided came from Chinese sources. Is that correct? To put it in the right, in the record, I told the people in the White House, I told the people in the DNC, more money I can make doing business with these Chinese people, more money I can donate to the DNC. That's all I said. Well, you to said... To answer your question, I did not tell them face to face the money from Chinese source. At no time did you tell anyone that the funds you were providing came from the Chinese government. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. There, since you didn't tell them this, they clearly did not know that. Is it also true that when this thing emerged, every dime that you gave was returned. Is that correct? Are you asking him a question, uh, sir? Is that a statement or that's a question? I'm sorry. Well, I'm asking you to confirm what I'm saying. Okay. Did the DNC return all the funds that you gave them? Yeah, they returned the money to me. All right. So, A, they did not know what the source was, and B, since there was a question mark concerning it, they returned it. That's all we have concerned this item. Mr. Lentos. I tell you, let me just finish. <clears throat> I tell you what I think is happening at the moment in terms of the Chinese fury offensive. 
because it's not a naive offensive. It is just three weeks before the 10th anniversary of Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square, which has indelibly labeled this despicable communist regime as one of the worst violators of human rights on the face of this planet. And what they are about is changing the subject. They are changing the subject, which they will not succeed in doing so, because my distinguished Republican colleague, Congressman Wolf, and I, later this week, are, in, are introducing a resolution commemorating the martyrs of Tiananmen Square. The hundreds of Chinese citizens, students, and others who passionately believe, along with all of us here, in a free and open and democratic society, they killed those people, and they killed them deliberately. They killed them purposefully. They were not killed like the four Chinese citizens were killed in Belgrade by a tragic accident. They were murdered by this regime. And the current fury offensive is designed to divert attention to what is really going to happen in three weeks. The whole world will commemorate Tiananmen Square, and they would like people to talk about other things. Now, this will be a very expensive exercise for China. Foreign investment in China will plummet. Travel from the West to China will vanish. And the Chinese people will play an enormous price for this communist regime overreaching. They could not gracefully accept the public apology of the President of the United States. They could not gracefully accept the public apology of all the American people. We profoundly regret the death of the four people who were killed in Belgrade. But we reject resent and repudiate the outrageous practice of this government of pretending that this action, so clearly a mistake, was deliberate, and of holding back from the Chinese people the knowledge, A, that this was an accident, and B, that the whole campaign against Milosevic is designed to protect and preserve the human rights of a million eight hundred thousand people, 90 percent of whom have been driven out of their homes, thousands of whom have been massacred by communist thugs, vast numbers of women mass raped by them, hundreds of communities torched to prevent these people from returning to Kosovo. Your role in this whole thing is a terribly minor little role. You may or may not have been used to funnel funds to political parties. You claim that the funds were yours, so you were not a conduit. People will debate this for a long time. But I think it's extremely important before we get fixated on the importance of your activities, which, if in fact you feel that you were used as a tool, were despicable, were despicable. They are just part and parcel of a communist regime's broad offensive against democratic societies. To them, the end justifies any means, whether it is political contributions or mass murder. And it is in this context, I believe, that your testimony needs to be understood. I yield back the balance of my Mr. time. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to respond to Mr. Extinguished Ch Mr. Congressman. <laughs> Mr. Landos, I will remember your question to me for my lifetime, for sure. For the Harry, Harry Wu issue, I know there are so many people try to rescue him, including you. I congratulated you, I applauded you. For me to participate to get Harry Wu out, it's part of American citizen. 
that's inside of me. If ever I have to do it again, I will. Even he said that I will try to do the self-serving. No. If it happens again, I will do whatever I can. That's why I applaud you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chung, let me just say that anybody who participated, however marginally, in saving this true and courageous man deserves some credit. And to whatever extent you contributed to that, you deserve some credit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chung, focusing uh, for just a, a few moments back on some previous questions uh, by Mr. Waxman with regard to your initial meeting with General G, uh, at which time, uh, as you've testified under oath, that General G uh, made uh, essentially four statements to you. Uh, one, we really like your president. Two, we hope he will be reelected. Three, I will give you $300,000. And four, you can give it to your president and the Democrat Party. Uh, it seems to me a reasonable presumption that when General G made those statements, they reflected a certain intent on his part, not necessarily on yours, but on his part. And it seems to me that a reasonable person could conclude from those statements and the fact that he did come through with the $300,000 that he had an intent that at least part of that money would be used to influence American politics and the re-election of the president. That would be reasonable presumption of his intent, correct? That's correct. Uh, and in fact, is it also reasonable to conclude that the reason that you felt that your life was endangered and the reason that the FBI provided protective custody for you was because that was General G's intent and he was concerned that you would be disclosing that to U.S. authorities as part of your plea agreement, would that also be a reasonable conclusion? That's correct. Do you consider that your life was in danger in 1998 because of the leaked story that appeared in the New York Times? That's correct, and I'm still looking on my back every day. Did you leak that information in any way, shape, or form to the New York Times? No, I don't leave that information to the New York Times. And would it also be accurate that your attorneys didn't leak that information to the New York Times? We tried to stop them. Exactly. Uh, where do you think the information might have come from that was leaked to the New York Times? Mr. Congressman, if you find it out, would you let me know? Well, we'd, we'd like the Department of Justice to, to find that out. Uh, and uh, it would be very interesting. Uh, to find out, one, if they are concerned about it, because this is a very damaging leak that endangered a very important witness yourself, uh, and it may very well have come from the Department of Justice. So we want to, we, we would be very interested in, in that, as I'm sure you would be. Mr. Mr. Congressman, at that night, I have to go to a meeting with those people. My attorney told me that don't go. Maybe you are in trouble, in danger. I talked to my wife, I talked to my attorney again, and I talked to the FBI. I want to go for it because I want the truth to come out. Thank you. Uh, during your conversations that you had with Mr. Liu, uh, did he ask you about your family? In the Chinese way, yes. Uh, was it in a, in a way that relayed to you that he wasn't really concerned about your family. He was telling you something that you ought to be concerned about your family. That's correct. Uh, and did he ask you about your family in the context of hoping that you would not disclose information? If you keep your mouth shut, you will be safe. If you are talking, the thing is out of control. That's why we called. You also mentioned an attorney. Uh, that is connected with Mr. Liu, and would that be Mr. Brockway, an attorney in Los Angeles? Mr. Liu gave me the business card of Mr. David Brockway in Los Angeles. And did you have any meetings with, with Mr. Liu at which Mr. Brockway was there? That's the meeting, yes, with the food of the uh, FBI agent around in that private club, with the, uh, 
with a body wire. And was, did Mr. Liu also suggest to you that you should use Mr. Brockway as your attorney? Yes, and not only that, he also said my attorney, Mr. Brian Sun, is also the earphone for the president, so don't hire him, get rid of him, which I don't think so. And did Mr. Liu also say that if you did hire Mr. Brockway, the attorney's fees would be taken care of? That's one of the questions I asked. He said, well, it's been taken care of, don't worry. And did Mr. Liu also tell you that he received money from Beijing? In the conversation, yes. In your discussion with Mr. Brockway, the attorney from Los Angeles, uh, did Mr. Liu tell you that Mr. Brockway had contacts at the Department of Justice? That's Mr. Brockway told me. He had the contact with the Department of Justice. Okay. Mr. Brockway told you that he had contacts high up at the Department of Justice? Number three of the Department of Justice. The third senior position? That's all I can recall, yes. And did uh, Mr. Brockway also uh, tell you that he knew the judge that would be, who would be sentencing you? That's correct. And was there also oh, a dis which, Mr. Congress, Congressman, which I don't believe. Yeah. But, he, but he made those representations to you? Yes, that's correct. Uh, did he also mention to you a, uh, either Mr. Brockway or Mr. Liu a pardon, a possible pardon? The presidential pardon, if I keep my mouth shut. And did Mr. Liu also mention the name of General G, who was behind him? That was under a dozen meeting civilian and also the wiretap. He mentioned that. Did this Mr. Brockway also talk about having been connected with? the Watergate case or cases? He mentioned to me he the attorney, attorney for the Watergate. Did he mention anything more specifically than that? No. Maybe he think I don't know too much about Watergate. Excuse me just a moment, Mr. Chung. During your, your meetings after, your, after the entry of your plea in early 1998, uh, during those meetings that you had with Mr. Liu and with Mr. Brockway, the, the FBI was aware of what was going on. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Every move, every word I said was under instruction of the FBI. So when you testified that uh, Mr. Liu mentioned that uh, he was receiving money from Beijing, uh, and that uh, General G was behind him. Uh, the FBI knew that those conversations had taken place, correct? That's all on the videotape or audio tape. So if somebody uh, characterized to you the position that the Department of Justice did not know that there was evidence that money from was coming from Beijing, that would be incorrect, would it not? Can you frame your question a little bit sure. more? Sure. He's having a little trouble, Kung. Yes. If somebody said to you, Mr. Chung, the Department of Justice didn't have any idea any money was coming from Beijing, did they? That would be an inaccurate characterization. That wouldn't be true, would it? Because they, through the FBI, at least here, the, the, the they one, knew that there was evidence money was coming from Beijing. I, I did not know that there's money coming from Beijing for this issue or not, because I was under protection at that time. Uh, if somebody told me they did come, the money go to Mr. Liu, then the Department of Justice or FBI, they should know. 
were you asking about the money that Liu Jiaoying gave to him? I think he's confusing the money that Mr. Liu suggested to him that, that he could receive if he kept his mouth shut. So there's, there's a little there's confusion two, two in his two. mind. Because during the course of the uh, conversations with Mr. Liu, that subject came up, that he could get some money if he kept his mouth quiet. Right. I mean, we, we, we do know there's no confusion, at least here today in, in our discussion, that there was $300,000 that came from overseas. I mean, we know that. Is that, is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And we also, we also know through your sworn testimony that Mr. Liu maintained, told you, that he was getting money from Beijing in his discussions with you about providing an attorney, for example. That's correct. Okay. So the fact of the matter is that since all of this information has been relayed to the FBI, the Department of Justice did know that money was probably coming from China. That's a fair, that's correct. I, I, I think so. Thank you very much, Mr. Chung. The gentleman yields back to balance of his time. The chairman is correct. Uh, Mr. Waxman, you have 10 minutes. I, I yield to, to Ms. Mink. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and uh, as a uh, Asian American, I uh, appreciate very much your forthright statements today and understand the difficulty of having all of these questions fired at you and sometimes with double negatives and so forth, it is very difficult to respond. I wanted to start off my <clears throat> portion of the questioning by underscoring what you said in your original testimony, and that is with the furor that arose out of the contributions that were made to the Democratic National Committee following the 1996 elections. Indeed, Chinese Americans throughout the country suffered gravely from false accusations, false intimidations, false assumptions that their motives in participating in political campaigns was somehow colored or connected to devious arrangements and the actions by the political parties in giving weight to such inferences I found very, very disconcerting. For instance, their immediate reaction was to not accept any contributions from any person that had an Asian-sounding name. And many people called my office very indignant about the inferences that were being left by the people who were calling them. So I can understand your <clears throat> great concern about what all this scandal has meant for Asian Americans throughout this country. That carried forward even during the debate of the campaign reform measure, which I strongly supported. But in the last hours of our deliberations on the floor, they added a provision in the House which said that the burden fell upon the candidate to assure that there were no contributions being made by legal residents. People who were legally admitted to the United States were being forbidden to make campaign contributions. That is how far the hysteria went. So I can fully understand your concern about what all of this has meant to all Chinese Americans, all Asian Americans throughout the United States. And I wanted to concur very vehemently with your views in that regard. The personal <clears throat> difficulties that you and your family have endured is also something which I think we have to share. And the reason for my making this uh, statement is that I am confused with all that has been said about your involvement in the 96 period. What was it that the government finally, after all of the investigations, all of the inquiries that were made with regard to your participation, what was, was it that they finally asked you to plead to, charge you with, and find you convicted and guilty of? Could you explain that to this committee? Because I think that's important for the record. There's a two account of the campaign finance violation, Mr. Bina to use uh, my employee 
to give the money to the DNC, and I, ref I refund, I, I reimburse them. And the other issue is tax issue uh, of 95. I still try to figure it out. I'm not good in the uh, money account. I still try to figure it out, tax violation. And the other one is the bank fraud for the mortgage. And I try to protect my family. And there's a one Chinese mafia come to after me for the money after this all come out. And he asked me to give that $200,000 to him, the gentleman named Peter Chen. If I don't give it to him, he will kill my family and will kill me, even put a lot of threat to my employee. I made a mistake because of my name is too big on the news. So I asked my wife, my wife said under my instruction to get a loan. The house is already paid off. And try to get the money as soon as I can to give it to this gentleman who tried to kill my whole family. That's all I pray. Now, with any of those charges that you were asked to plead to have anything to do with serving as a conduit for foreign contributions to the Democratic National Committee or any Democratic candidate? No. Was there any allegation in any of these charges to which you pleaded that had anything to do with any foreign contribution coming from these officials that you met with in Beijing, Hong Kong, wherever? No. None of the allegations that you have finally now been convicted of and are serving a probation has anything to do with all this that has been out in the press about your connections with high-placed military people who gave you money to give to the Democratic Party and to the Democratic candidates? No. Was there, in any, in any of the testimony that you have given, to this committee or any other committee or the Department of Justice conflict in any way with the testimony that you've given to us today that as far as you were concerned, the $300,000 that you received was your money that you could do whatever you wished with it? Yes. So you took that $300,000 and considered it a business investment, is that correct? That's correct. That was what the that's conversation. What she, yes. That's what the conversation was between you and uh, Li Chao Ying. That's correct. And so, when the money was deposited in your bank, you considered it a contribution from Li Chao Ying or from General Ji. She always she told me that at the JW Marriott Hotel, she is going to invest in my company and for the amount of three hundred thousand dollars. So and your she, testimony is she wired to me from her account to my account. I consider that her money to me. There, there is proof and evidence that the funds that were deposited in your account came from her. That's correct. Now, the uh, Senate committee report indicates that based upon their review of contributions that you made, now I understand that this deposit was made in August of 96. Is that correct? Ma'am, at that time, I commingle a lot of money. At that time, I have two major, uh, uh, two big sums of money coming to my account almost simultaneously at the same time. But it's about August of 96. That's that correct. correct. From the evidence that seems to be available, there was no contribution that you made or could be attributed to you to the DNC after August of 96 in the sum of $300,000. Is that correct? Are you asking Mr. Chung uh, about the amount after yes. August? Because yes. I think in his statement, or in, we have told uh, members of both the majority and minority that there was $35,000 given to the DNC on two separate occasions following the receipt of the money from Liu Jiaoying. I think the bank records reflect that Mr. Chung received money from other business consulting clients right in and around that same time frame. So it's all sort of mixed together, although the uh, money that was used for the two events I just referred to, I think, could be traced back to the Liu Jiao Ying money in Hong Kong. Um, 
And then there was, I believe, the John Kerry event in September of 1996 as well, but that was not to the DNC, that was to Senator Kerry's uh, re-election. The uh, Senate report, which I have a page reference, says that the FBI can only trace $20,000 of the $300,000 uh, to the Democratic National Committee. Do you say that that statement in the report is incorrect? Trace back to Liu Jiaoying's money? No, trace back to Mr. Chung as a contribution after August of 96. We've already been told in this committee that as far as he was concerned, the $300,000 was his to spend in any way that he wished. The report now indicates that only $20,000 of that money, if any, went to the Democratic National Committee. In other words, he did take $280,000 for the business investment purposes which he understand that money was for. I'm trying to find out if that's accurate or not. Yeah, I'm sorry to interject uh, for Mr. Chung because he's not as familiar with the record, so <clears throat> I, b I believe we can clarify that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Following his receipt of money from Ms. Liu, uh, Mr. Chung attended the uh, President's 50th birthday party in New York, and I believe on that occasion the records would reflect that he donated up about $20,000, I believe. And then later on that month, he attended some events at the Democratic National Convention. I believe there were two checks for $10,000 and $5,000 respectively. Now, it's during the same time frame that Mr. Chung received um, about a total of, I think, about $300,000 from, from other business consulting clients between August 14th and August 28th. So it's in that time frame that he makes these $35,000 in subsequent donations. But I think, believe the records reflect it's $35,000 in three separate checks. I think that uh, what the report is trying to link up is that specific $300,000, which he received from uh, Li Chao Ying. And their assumption is that they can only trace $20,000 of that. And what you've said is that there were other monies coming into his account, some up to $300,000, out of which other kinds of contributions could have been made. I'm simply trying to find some corroborative evidence, since there's been some question as to the differing testimonies that appear from Mr. Chung, trying to find corroborative evidence somewhere to emphasize that none of the contributions from Li Chao Ying specifically went to the Democratic National Committee uh, because of instructions that he had received in China. That's correct. So your answer to my question is that none of it went directly to the DNC because you felt you had been instructed to do so. I, I think I understand the question. I'm trying to explain it okay. to Mr. Chung. I didn't think, Mr. Chairman, that I asked such a difficult question. I might have to withdraw it. <laughs> uh, Congressman, with, and with, uh, actually, it's a good question because the bank records, which we only recently were able to get a hold of, sort of answer your questions. And I was trying to remind Mr. Chung, who's not as familiar with these records, the lawyers and the investigators and the staffers are intimately familiar with them to sort of try to articulate it, and uh, I think he can if try to do it. If the chair would allow the attorney to respond to uh, my question, uh, if that's uh, a, uh, all right. Uh, you're out of time, but I think it's it's important that we clarify this. We have a chart that I think we could put up oh. on the screen that might help you okay. with your question. Uh, would you put this chart up on the screen uh, for Ms. Mink? Uh, if you look at the chart, and I'll, I'll let you let him answer this question, You'll show it shows the $300,000 going, and then <coughs> on... Uh, this, oh, the, the money was given to Mr. Chung on the 14th oh, of August. On the 15th of August, mm -hmm. he wired uh, $80,000 to his account in the uh, CalFed bank account <coughs> in Los Angeles. And then on the 19th, uh, 
there was uh, 30, 000, 19th and 27th, there was 30,000 that was transferred to another account. And then on the 18th, the 28th, and the 29th, there were three separate contributions totaling 35,000, which are up there. And if you'd like, I'll give you a copy of this so you can take a close look at it. I, I, I would like to have I'd like to answer, answer you. because that, the chart doesn't really uh, refer to yeah. my like, sense of the, of the question that I felt should be answered. I'd like to answer your question. Is I, I also took Mr. Lee and Mr. Yu and the other people. Uh, at that time, I received some money from them. I took those two different people, go to the uh, uh, New York radio Radio City's uh, president, 50 years old birthday, I donated money, which is I donated Mr. Liu Taoyin's money for different people. And I also received money from them. I also took those people to DNC convention, which I donated donate Liu Taoyin's money to, the, to that, that event, which I also received from a lot of people. It's very confused for me at that time. I was really commingled all of the money together. I'm not taking Liu Chaoyin's money, take Liu Chaoyin to go to event. I'm taking Liu Chaoyin's, could be, at that time, I'm using Liu Chaoyin's money with other people. I take with it, but I also receive the consulting fee from those people. That's what I try to explain to you. It really commingle together. Yeah, the, I guess my time is up. All well, right. if, you like, if you like, we can, we can go back. Uh, I think your side has another 10 minutes, uh, <coughs> 10 minutes to maybe Mr. Last one can yield to you, Mr. Thank you. Hutchinson. <clears throat> Thank the chair, and I'm grateful for you holding these hearings. I believe this is uh, certainly an important issue, and I appreciate Mr. Chung's testimony today. I also want to comment that I thought Mr. Waxman's comment at the very outset was uh, uh, certainly appropriate that uh, any time we have a witness that's making serious uh, statements, uh, accusations after pleading guilty uh, to an offense, uh, credibility should always be an issue. I think that we should listen uh, very openly to the testimony. Uh, I think the most important thing is not uh, pointing fingers as to who's right or who's wrong, but as to what we can do from a legislative standpoint to correct any abuses in the system. For that reason, I'm very grateful to the uh, chairman for uh, sponsoring the uh, Conduit Contribution Prevention Act, addressing a serious uh, uh, loophole, allowing foreign uh, contributions into our political system. And I'm delighted to uh, uh, express my appreciation to the chairman for that effort. Uh, I think that the testimony that I've heard today raises a number of concerns. Certainly the first one is, is whether our national security uh, has been compromised in any way by covert efforts of a foreign government or groups to influence our political process. And I think there's a, a legitimate question as to whether the flow of soft money uh, into uh, parties affects national policy, particularly critical decisions by the Commerce Department uh, that approves the transfer of technology. That is a serious question that we need to address as the Congress. And uh, then I think we have to look at it from a legislative standpoint as to whether there are additional uh, areas that need to be plugged improvements in the law to make sure that the system works appropriately. I noticed that, Mr. Chung, you indicated in your testimony that the system is set up so that if you donate money, you can participate. Now, I understand that you, as an Asian American, has seen that part of the system, which is not very pretty. But I want you to know also that there's another system in America that works. And if you go to my state, you'll see Asian Americans there coming to political functions, uh, going and knocking on doors for candidates that are participating, perhaps not the level that you sought to participate, but there is active, open participation at the grassroots level. And so the problem that we're seeing is not the grassroots of American politics, but the problem is at the high dollar level of American politics. And you've certainly shed some light on that, but there's another way you can enter politics. Perhaps it might be a little bit more rewarding to you. Now, uh, I wanted to ask the, the first question, Mr. Chung, has the Department of Justice discouraged you in any way from testifying today? No. And the restrictions, have they put any restrictions on your testimony that would affect your ability to tell the truth completely? The only uh, very minor limitation of few people, name cannot be come out for ongoing investigation. Certain names, you have to be careful not to come out that might be classified. That's correct. Other than that, uh, you have all the incentives to tell the truth today. That's correct. Now. I intend to do that. 
during the time frame that you're engaged in high-level politics, contributing hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, did anyone ever mention to you the difference between hard money contributions and soft money contributions? No. Until but, very last day of the campaign finance scandal broke out, I, I learned it from the newspaper. And so you were simply, were you aware that there were contribution limits as to how much you could give a federal candidate? I did not really read those regulations at all. As a chairman of my company, I, I don't open the mail. I only know what the meeting should I go or where should I go. And so if someone asks you for $50,000, you assume it was all right? That's correct. Now. You uh, painted the picture uh, that you were receiving this money uh, from your foreign business contacts, and some of them were interested in, a, in, your, in your assistance in getting a visa. Is that correct? Uh, but they want to come over here to the United States. They need a visa, yes. Well, they were asking your assistance in getting a visa. That's correct. And so they would give you money and... Uh, with the understanding that you would contribute to politics in America with the hope that that would be of some assistance in them getting a visa? Not only to help them to obtain the visa, but also to provide them, let me, let me make it easy with a tour guide, trans, transportation, expense in the United States, in translator service, and set up business with them. The more important to attract me is to do business with them here in the United States. That's all my goal. So the visa was a small part of that. A part of it. Now, and so whenever you were having to get that visa, were you having to use any improper influence to pay any money to get that visa? I did give my testimony here. Talk uh, to a Mr. Mr. Parrish. That I stay with that statement I said to you. All right, and that was part of the money you were getting from your business contacts. Some of it was flowing to Mr. Parrish. That's correct. And did you have to utilize any other political contacts in order to assist your business clients in getting visas other than Mr. Parrish? I used to ask Mr. Richard Sullivan of DNC try to help me on this. He said he will, but he never did. That's a conversation. That was with Mr. Sullivan? Of the TNC, but he never did. I did mention to him, but he never did anything for me. D did you ever have any dis... As you brought these people over, uh, many times they were interested in an issue, for example, uh, uh, developing business or a trade issue. Is that true? That's correct. And did you, whenever you would bring them to a, a high-level contact in government, would you all discuss an issue? The only issue I remember, they, everyone, they always ask the President of the United States, come to visit China. That's all I know. Now, give me a flavor as to some agency. Did you meet with any agencies? Uh, what agency let, you talk about? Pardon? What, what agency you talk about? Well, I'm trying to, you said the only issue you talked about was inviting people to come back to China. Uh, you never had any uh, specific issues or help that you needed from the uh, United States government? No. Uh, uh, with the gentleman, you know, I, I, I think uh, he, he indicated uh, that he took somebody to the Security and Exchange Commission and, yes, that, and also, what was the other one? And the Energy Department. Yes. The, the Security, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, Security Exchange Commission, you took someone there? Yes. And what was the issue to be discussed there? There's a issue of Mr. Yao would like to have the Chinese company to be leased in a New York Stock Exchange. And then he would like to know the regulation. And really we've been talking about is a regulation inside with that two uh, government officer. Is, is this the meeting that uh, Mr. Kerry or someone, Mr. Senator Kerry's staff helped set up? That's correct. Now, your testimony was in reference to this that uh, about your, the John Kerry contribution that 
you had already obligated yourself to contribute to Mr. Kerry back in July when his people arranged the meeting at the SEC for Liu Chao Ying. That's correct. Now, why did you believe you're obligated to contribute? In my Chinese cultural background, somebody did something good for you, and you had to do something back to them. I think it's American way too. And then I, that's why I talked to Senator John Kerry's staff back there at the DNC Convention Center at the Chicago. I said, I will try to hold a fundraiser party for him. So it was nothing that was said by Senator Kerry or his staff that gave you that feeling. It was just your own sense that you ought to contribute. Yes. Now, you indicated that you tried to talk with the DNC Chairman Don Fowler at one particular point, and you testified that Mr. Fowler scolded you for not meeting your fundraising obligations. Uh, do you recall that? I will. It was the uh, October 96 on the Back to the Futures event in Los Angeles at Hollywood. And uh, we, well, I, I gave my testimony here already. They took my driver and my secretary to meet with the president. That was the event. Well, and back. we we was in the parking lot, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I said, well, Mr. Chairman, can I take a picture with you? And he said, I don't want to take a picture with you. You, you didn't give what you said to me. I don't want to be your friend. I don't want to take a picture with you. That was a picture. Did you ever talk to Mr. Fowler about any issues? I tried to rescue Harry Wu. That was one of the issues. And you talked to him about that? And he also wrote a letter to me raising about that issue. And did you feel like any, your, any of your contributions were related in any way to any assistance that he might give in reference to Mr. Wu? I, I don't I don't think so. Do you recall during this two or three year period ever having any discussions about issues? You know, I'm t when I say issue, do you know what I'm talking about? Whether it's a meeting with the Security Exchange Commission or a meeting with the Energy Department, was there ever any uh, matter that was raised by you or your business clients in which the response was closely tied to a, any contribution that you would make. Not with the not with the people back no. Uh, only. Excuse me. One oh, I'm sorry. I, At one instant on March 9, 1995, regarding our presidential radio address, I did mention to Don, Mr. Chairman Don Fallow and uh, Mr. Richard Sullivan about I want to bring these uh, important uh, people to go to the, to the radio address, and uh, I showed them my wish list. And I did mention to them I would like to donate for $50,000 if I can get all of this issue, which is my wish, wish list to be granted. And I did mention to them at the DNC, except this one. Mr. Chairman, I've not finished, but I'm, my time's up. Back. We'll, uh, uh, give you some, we'll give everybody some more time after we finish this round. Uh, you, Mr. Waxman, you have 10 minutes. Yield to Ms. Shikowsky. Thank you very much. If I could just begin by saying that I have more Asian Americans in my Illinois district than any other state and than any other district in the state and they have acutely felt that the path to their rightful political empowerment has been impeded as fallout from this situation and they feel unfairly targeted as perpetrators somehow of campaign finance abuses. I deeply regret this and believe that Chinese Americans and Asian Americans should be encouraged to participate fully even in a system that is as deeply flawed as ours and that cries out for reform, but not because it's uniquely abused by Chinese Americans or the Chinese government, but because it fosters the analogy that you raise that somehow access to power is like paying for a ride in the, uh, in the subway. Um, let me just tell you what I see. I see a, a prominent United States uh, 
businessman that has established himself as very well connected, so connected that he even is often with the President of the United States, that you've been able to um, barter that for more business, to help other businesses like a, a beer company, that you've established yourself as a go-to guy, someone who can get things done. And so it would seem logical to me that Ms. Liu, General G, or anyone else might see that giving money to you, not giving money through you to someone, but giving money to you would be advantageous for them. And that that is essentially the nature of a contribution to you. Do you see it that way? I see that, yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So it would, it would seem to me then, when, when at the time that you got that money, if this is this is money that's being given to you, that you felt, and this has been asked many times, but when, when you gave $20,000 and not $300,000 to the DNC, were you worried about that? Were you worried that you had broken some sort of commitment? Were you in fear for your life? Or did you feel that this was money that you could spend and that you were spending it as you thought? This is my money, I spend the way I want to spend it. So at that point, there was no fear of retribution that somehow you had violated an order or even an understanding? No. I wanted to ask you about these fears in your life. In your written testimony, you said that you thought your family was threatened by Robert Liu. But in your answers to questions about your bank fraud that um, Representative Meek had asked, you said that you thought that your life and your family's life was threatened by Peter Chang. I wanted to just clarify that this was a completely separate death threat, is that correct? That's correct, but depend on the, what FBI has been told. How many times has your life or your family's life then been threatened in your view? And you mean in danger? These two instances. Those, those two times. Um, well, I, I thank you. I have uh, no further questions and would yield back my time. Um, I'll, I'll take the time. I'm oh, sorry. I, can, can, I would yield back my time to time back Representative Wax. Hey, Mr. Waxman, can I just to say some little bit statement with it? I feel so sorry for my family. My wife, I love deeply. My 17 years old daughters, who is a uh, top student in the, the high school, the top 10 graduated, and she almost cannot attend the graduation. The last two weeks of the high school, she had to go to go back to school with the FBI escort. I feel so sorry for my two years old daughters and five years son. They have to under the uh, government protection for 24 hours a day, and they cannot do whatever they want to do. I love my family so much. If I want to say I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry to my family. And they should not deserve on this. But they all behind me to come out and tell the truth. Because my daughter told me that she is a college student now. She said that no matter you like it or not, this is part of American history. What do you want to do with it? I said to her, I want to set the record straight. Mr. Chung, uh, I appreciate what I'm you sorry. have to say. It's clearly coming from your heart. Uh, you had a, a threat to your life by somebody that had to do with the mortgage. Did that have anything to do with the uh, Chinese government? Or is this so something else? That, that, is, that, is that organized crime that you're fearful of, or is it something to do with... Peter the, Chen, the, is uh, what he said to me, he is organized crime and he was asked to come to ask me for that $200,000. If that's, I don't give it to him, he will kill my family. That's the mortgage money? That's the mortgage I try to get it out. But it's not related, or is it related in any way to uh, General Xi or uh, anybody else in China that you've been dealing with on these political contributions issue? Well, I, as I told you, I got the money from Liu Chaoyin, the money I put it in, to my account, portion of them I pay for mortgage. And then 
the house already pay off. Then this gentleman come out to ask the money. So I take a uh, mortgage and pay for it. Hey, Mr. Sun, do you I, I think I can help a little bit, Congressman. The reason why it's a complicated answer is because I believe uh, there's some information suggesting that Mr. Chang knows some of the other people that Mr. Chung dealt with in China. So you could draw all kinds of circles and links to each other. I don't know if he should speculate beyond that, but there is some information suggesting that Mr. Chang know some of the people that Mr. Chung dealt with in China, and I don't know if but, we should go beyond that. Yeah, but basically it sounds like you owed some money and they were they were after you to get that money back and threatening him. Is that is that the, is that the situation? Basically, is they want to get the, their investment back. It, it, this was in connection with a $200,000 investment by the Great Wall Cultural Association and some of those individuals one of whom introduced Mr. Chung to Robert Liu. Um, you've been here for hours, and you've been asked these questions over and over again, and you've given your, your testimony, I think, in a forthright way. But you might be surprised to know that on one of the media outlets, there is a report that says Johnny Chung testified today that he was directed by the Chinese government and gave that $300,000 at their direction to the Democratic Party. Is that an accurate statement for a reporter to make as a of what your testimony is all about? I, I tell the whole truth to the government, no. And you've been telling the truth here today? Is yeah, that right? I am. And the truth of the matter was that you, you received money from a woman who was going into business with you. You considered it your money. You didn't. Uh, give contributions to the Democratic Party from money from the Chinese government, as far as you know, that, that, that the money was from her to you as part of an investment, and then you use part of that money for contributions, and most of it for your own personal business. I give the money, I clearly think that's my own money, I donate it. Well, you've answered it in, at so many different times, and it just uh, it, it amazes me how the press can keep on repeating wrong information. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield uh, back the balance of our time on this 10-minute round. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Horn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few questions to clarify the uh, testimony. Did anybody within the Department of Justice or the administration tell you what you could or could not tell this committee? Did you have any people that sought picture, to right? instruct you? I, I'm sorry, I got a hear, hear pro, hearing problem. I'm sorry. Did any people in justice or in the administration tell you what you could say or could not say to this committee? Did anyone give you any advice? No. Okay, so uh, this is all from you with perhaps your lawyers cautioning you one way or the other, I take it. Uh, in August of 96, you note that you had a lot of money commingled in your accounts, and you regarded this basically as your money. Uh, do you know of any money that came to you in a year before the November 96 election that might have had its origin in China and simply in the Chinese government and simply put it in your accounts because you were the one that was connected with the Democratic National Committee and other political parties? I think he's having trouble understanding the question, Congressman. Did, if the, is the question... The question is, you had a number, uh, you had really several million dollars, didn't you, in those accounts made up of different uh, investments, in quote. And the question is this, uh, if you had that money, is, did any of it come, in your mind, from the Chinese government or agents of the Chinese government? No. Okay, so all of that other money was simply to give it to you to invest, even though all of the people probably knew that you were very active in fundraising yes. for the Democratic Party and the presidential campaign. Yeah. Basically, I know they're all businessmen who I deal with it, except I already gave my testimony at the Dat Apolloni restaurant in Hong Kong, where they can, I can uh, deal with the General G. That's what I know, that information. 
Beside that one, I know all of them, they're businessmen. Uh, you cite a judge uh, on page 12. Uh, is that Judge Riel, federal district judge? That's correct. Well, I just, having known uh, Judge Riel, I must say, if we'd had him in Washington, D.C., this investigation would have been over uh, two years ago, and a lot of people would be confessing, uh, not uh, enjoying the sunshine hither and yon with the 121 that are somewhere else that we can't get our hands on. He is one tough judge, like Judge Sir, uh, Sirico was uh, in the Nixon Watergate thing. But uh, unfortunately, he's 3,000 miles away. So we don't have the benefit of his services here in the judicial uh, group in District of Columbia. Now, I'm curious on the Boeing representative that you mentioned. Uh, was he Chinese or was he an American, to your knowledge? the Boeing representative that you uh, had in Hong, that you talked to in Hong Kong? When Mr. Liu Chang tried to ask me to get in, get, in, uh, get in touch with the Boeing company for the reason of buying commercial parts or Boeing commercial parts, I give my order to my former general manager, Irene Wu, say, write some letter to Boeing company and see what we can find, who we can talk. But because she didn't make it, the trip, that was there, nothing else. Now, you note here you had limited dealings with Mark Middleton. Mr. Yao? Could you sum up? And to answer your question, Mr. Yao. Oh, Mr. Yao. I do not know Mr. Yang is a Chinese American or, or I don't know. Uh, you noted you had uh, limited dealings with Mark Middleton. Could you sum up for the committee exactly what those dealings were and what you know about Mark Middleton? I know him 1994 on Christmas party when I brought how many bill people there. It's then now because I'm the only one with those how many bill people without a CEDO. And he was one without a CEDO. And later on, I want to try to get a fax broadcasting service to be used with the White House. And I have a chance to talk to his staff at his office. As my statement here today, I was also talking about a lady named Ruth Lin about Swiss Bank. I talked to Mark Melodon about this, and that was this. Back there, when uh, Liu Chao Yin tried to talk to me, I, I raised my little bit concern about it, and she gave me the example, and she said, Mark Middleton, uh, through the uh, Singapore group, Mr. Wen, we gave Mark Middleton half million dollars. That's all I know. Now, was that overseas Chinese, or was that money from the Chinese government coming I in? I do not Singapore? know, you Mr. Don't Congressman. Know I do not know. But did Mr. Fowler or anyone with whom you had close relationship and were giving thousands of dollars, did any of them have any knowledge in any conversation they had with you that it came from the Chinese government? No. So you didn't see anybody in those you contributed to that had the slightest idea that any of that money would come from the Chinese government? No. Okay. Uh, just one... Uh, Mr. Congressman, I want to make it to the official record. I did talk to you last time. I know you come from Long Beach, right. which is my neighbor. I come from Artesia. I told you that the only official in, in Long Beach is you, I know. I do not know the mayor. I do not know the, don't know the uh, Long Beach Harbor Commissioner. The only reason I went to Long Beach, I take my children for fishing. Well, you picked the right town. You could take him to the aquarium. I want to clear the record. I got nothing to do with the Costco. Thank you. Okay. I did talk to you last time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming here and having four hours of this interrogation. We appreciate it. Thank you for your encouragement. Mr. Big, uh, Ms. Bigger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know, Mr. Chung, that this has been a, a long hearing, so I, I won't ask very many questions, but 
I would just like to know, uh, you talked about how you started your business, how you needed to expand capital, and from there uh, you went to targeting government agencies to, uh, to increase your business. How then did you get so involved in the political process uh, as far as uh, you know, supporting candidates or, because most people, I know you stated that you had been, um, when your family went to, the, to meet the president and the first lady at his birthday party, and there's not too many probably Americans that really do have the opportunity to do that. Uh, but from just from a, a start of a, up of a company then to being so involved with so many um, uh, events like that, how did that translate to from the business to um, hobnobbing with, with a lot of the, the politicians? I was doing my fax broadcasting business like an American salesman, try to market my fax broadcasting service state after state. And then I came to Washington, D.C. for National Governor Association meeting. And that would be the easiest way you can meet all of the governor's staff at the same time. You know, we, we are a great country. It's a big country. If you want to travel state after state, it takes a lot of time. And that's the only time I can meet all of them together. At that time, I got a, a lady named Miss Rita Lewis. She's a special assistant to the President, political affair at the White House. She invited me to go to the White House, and what my motivator is, I'm going to do business with my fax broadcasting. And later on, because as you know, I'm also a Taiwanese American, and the Taiwanese American Association here in the United States, we are talking about all the American citizens here. They raised about the issue of American passport. We are talking about American passport. And that the birthplace is always right down China. They would like to change it to Taiwan, which is they really was born in Taiwan. And I tried to ha help them up and try to set it up, the meeting. Finally, the meeting was set up by Ms. Rita Lewis. And also, we was invited to go to 48 years old birthday for the President Clinton. And we all agree, let me repeat, we are all American citizens. We all agree to go to that one. And then I begin to realize if you donate, you got access. Well, was there ever anybody then that told you or did you ask anyone about our campaign laws or the federal election laws uh, when you make a donation? Did you ask anybody how you do that? Uh, how much money you can donate, uh, or did anybody suggest to you? I never asked, never and asked. nobody told me. So there was no conversation about, well, how much is expected of me to give? I don't know the law. I never asked, and they, didn't, they never told me. Okay. Uh, regardless of whether it was a governor or whether it was uh, federal? I, I learned all of this after the campaign finance scandal broke out. Believe me, I got two and a half years, a lot of time, alone. I read a lot, and I begin to realize. Before that, I don't understand. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Souter. First off, let me say for the record that um, it's been stated several times that the Justice Department didn't find any case of laundering money in this uh, situation, I'm just, I'm shocked. I'm just astounded that our Justice Department didn't find any laundering of money. Um, that's sarcastic. Um, that, let me uh, ask a couple of questions. Did you view your business contributions, the ones you made, or the contributions you personally made to the Democratic Party as business investments, as part of the, you're doing business? Yes. Um, and when you got the $300,000, would you not have viewed some of that as a business investment to impress people by giving it to different political parties? As I my statement today, I always say that those people who gave me the money as an investment or the counseling, a consulting fee, they all know that part of it is going to give it to the political donation for the access. And I, again, I always say that that's my money, and I give it to. If I don't give the money, I don't think I get access. Because, in, in fact, it's 
impossible to separate the money because you and you've said that part of the reason you were drawn to their attention was the pictures. Uh, you've talked about the radio address. You've talked about the birthday party. And if that's kind of your business investments, aren't the politics of this inseparable from your business investments? Aren't they the same thing, roughly? Not all your money, but a big portion of it was getting pictures, radio addresses, and different things. So those are business investments. So what you're calling business investments, other people may call political contributions. Business investments. Because you got very upset. I'm a businessman. I call that business investment. Uh, in fact, in your testimony, you said that you got very upset. It was a funny story about your secretary and your driver when, in fact, the general's wife and son didn't get their picture. Presumably, wouldn't that have been because some of the general's money had helped buy the tickets? If they did take a pictures, the general's wife and the general's son, I will give $25,000. To the DNC, and and the general and that the money, whatever I have in my account, I will give it to. And wouldn't the general have been pretty upset if his wife had called him and his son and said, you know, I gave three hundred thousand dollars to to Mr. Trump? I do not know, I do not know that, but that, well, did you remember I said this? I charted all the way to the to the I mean a group of people there, and I introduced them with the president, and they did indeed take a pictures. He'd have probably been pretty upset, though, if his son and wife were there, and uh, he would not thought much of you as a businessman, if nothing else. He never told me. Or he, I never asked. You said you were uncomfortable uh, when you first, uh, even before you knew who he was, you were told in the car after that uh, first dinner that you were uncomfortable about the relationship uh, when he it was changing from what Lou had, had told you. Why were you uncomfortable? Did you view this as changing from a business investment to a political operation? Uh, were you afraid that there were some other implications here because you saw his power relationship? You didn't know at that point that he was director of intelligence. I think any Amer American businessman who get a chance to encounter with a equal to CIA director, everybody feel uncomfortable with it. I but do you, feel. But you didn't know that. I thought. I'm sorry. That when you first were at the dinner, you didn't know he. Well, was... he didn't tell me. He said he is the Mr. Xi. I told you he used a different name. Now, when you found out in the car that he was, in effect, their director of the CIA, why didn't you break it off then? I did bring, all, bring the issue to the general's daughter, but remember, Congressman, I have two teenagers back there in China with, this, with me on this vacation. And now I know this gentleman who is the uh, military director. I want to make sure my two teenagers I brought over there back so when he said, I do I, raise the issue. To, I want to tell you that I do raise the issue uncomfortable, but I have to keep quiet so to go back over there and bring When he over. said, I'd like you to hire my son, or they said he'd like you to hire, you didn't feel like you had much choice? That was a second meeting back there at the hotel in the, by the bar. When Mrs. G come down to join us, the whole entire conversation turned out to be a mama's and papa's. That's exactly my statement, okay? Mama's and papa's talk. And uh, it, he didn't say it, but I have to take it, this one as a, the, excuse me, the way of Chinese, very politely to say it. But if my son is a, going to be the student over there in UCLA. My son is going to live outside the campus. What do you think about it? I said, let go. I also got a teenager. You have to let go. Someday you have to face the empty nest. And why he talked to me a lot about this? Obviously, he want me to take care of the son. That's the only interp interpretation did, I can take. Did his son do a lot of work for you? Some, some, uh, not a lot. Did it, do you know what his son was doing? Did he seem to be just a student? Uh, could uh, did General G suggest any other employees to you? No, only the son. He didn't even suggest son, but. Miss Liu Taoyin suggests taking care of the son. While his son was on the payroll, do you, do you know if he did any calls back and forth? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Do you know if his son did any calls back and forth to his father while he was on your payroll? Did he ever use your business phone for that? Or I do not know, because I have so many employees in my office, I don't trace their phone call. But I do, in one encounter, he said he was going back for Christmas party, Christmas time, going back to China. To could, meet with the father. That's could, all I know. Could they have been using your office as a conduit at any point since you said you weren't tracing it and they clearly had $300,000 invested in your office? I, I, I don't get it.
I'm sorry, I don't get the last question. In other words, uh, you had the CIA director's son on your payroll working out of your office, and what you just said is that you didn't know what he was necessarily doing there, and I'm wondering whether he could have been any sort of a conduit in your office since you didn't know what he was doing, and yet he was the son of the CIA director. Many Americans may get investments. I, I, I don't know, but I also want to point it out, Alex, as I know, but he said to me, he came to the United States when he was 11 years old. So he been here for more than, he's more like an American boy, speak much more better English like my daughters. Okay, he's been here for 11 years. And then uh, he's working in my office, what I tried to ask him to do, doing a lot of research on one of the projects we are going to do with the fact broadcasting. And then he is working with one of my secretary. Okay, a lot of time is spent at the uh, library I mean, a library to try to find those fact broadcast information. That's all I try to give them instruction to do. That's all I know. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Senator. I guess now we'll wrap up. And Mr. We'll start, Chairman, we'll start with I... Mr. Waxman first, and then I'll summarize. And then if you have some comments, we'll let you comment. Did you have something you want to say right this minute? Can I have five minutes break for a restroom? Uh, okay, sure. Sure. We'll recess for five minutes, and then we'll wrap up. The committee will be recalled to order and will now yield to uh, Mr. Waxman for wrap-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chung, just so I can... I'm just trying to get one little piece that's still not clear in my mind. The time that General G told you that he wanted $300,000 to go to go to the president because he wanted him to be reelected, at least that's the impression we get that he wanted that money to go to the president's re-election. You didn't know who he was. You didn't know he was the head of intelligence at that point. Is that right? I don't. Okay. So what did you think that uh, here was some fellow trying to renegotiate the deal that you had already worked out with uh, uh, Lou? I told the this committee, I said, who the hell this guy is? Yeah. Inside my heart. So he was trying to tell you what to do with the money that you were expecting already for business purposes. That's correct. And then um, later you found out he was the head of intelligence and that and that made you uncomfortable because you thought he was trying to... Um, I, I raised the... I answered that question over and over. It, it, it is, as an American businessman, anyone with the CIA type, he raised uncomfortable, yes. So you went to Lou and you said, uh, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with this. And then she told you, well, go ahead and use the money for contributions, for your Taking care business, of the side. For, for everything that you had originally agreed to with her. Yes. Um, G General G at one time said that uh, he was going to wire the money to her. But you don't know, in fact, whether he did wire the money to her. I don't. But I, I heard what he said. I don't. You just heard what he said. Yeah. And, but as far as you know, you got the money from her. From her. Yeah. Well, I, I have to tell you, uh, we've been here all this time for uh, almost five hours. And we started the hearing with statements about this huge Chinese plot tying everything in together, the people in Los Alamos uh, and, and, and uh, national security being jeopardized. It may well be jeopardized. We don't know. But it seems to me to tie that into the story you have to say to us is a big reach. Uh, what I've heard from you and what I know about you is that you found a system where if you put in money, you got access. And if you got access, it helped you get business. And you use that system. And it's a shame that we have a system like that, but that was the system. Can I call American way? That's American way. It was the American way. 
And uh, you impressed a lot of people, including uh, Liu and General Ji and others, with the fact that you were a person who had influence and could get things done. That's correct. And they wanted to have influence with you. They wanted to do business with you. Isn't that right? They, they, maybe they thought I'm important. I think they did. And one theory could be they were just using you to give money to the President Clinton, but that seems hard to accept when it turned out you only gave maybe $35,000, maybe $20,000, but you know, less than 10% or around 10% of the total amount of money to the Democrats. It, it, it Mr. doesn't Con sound Mr. To me Congressman, I, I always told you that the money always co commingled together. That's right. But they, if, if they were trying to get $300,000 to the President, if that's what General G was trying to do, he didn't do a very, he didn't succeed, did he? He didn't. Um, it's my money, I've donated. The commingle, all of the money together, is my business money. Well, I, I think that, uh, I think that what you're saying is, is, is an accurate statement. Uh, I think if others want to make a, a, a deal out of this, that the Chinese were directing a scheme and a conspiracy, it seems to me that's a pretty far reach from your testimony and what we've heard today. They may be right, but it's a, but it's a conclusion that is fully speculative uh, without enough uh, factual basis for it. All we know is that you received uh, money from foreign business people, including um, uh, Liu, and uh, she had some connection with his general um, who s suggested to you he'd like you to help. But when he said you can give money to your president, when somebody says you can do this, doesn't mean you have to do it. It means you can do it. You could do it. You can do it. Well, I, um, I'm amazed at the press because the press, I think, is continuing even to report this hearing as a hearing where it was clear that the Chinese government gave money to you and you, in turn, gave that $300,000 in, in money that you received to the president, and it showed that the Chinese government was trying to reelect the president for whatever reasons. And it just seems to me that's a, that's a conclusion that it's hard to come to. Mr. Waxman, the press also destroyed my reputation, my business, also destroy everything I own. I'm broke. I'm, more, I'm worse than broke. Well, it's a pretty sad commentary because as a result of all this, you have been hurt. Maggie Williams has been hurt. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, O'Leary, Secretary O'Leary's reputation had been hurt. All these people had to incur legal fees in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, as I'm sure you have, over when all is said and done, nothing that is substantial, substantial in establishing any kind of criminal actions. Uh, I just think it's been a huge waste of taxpayers' money and a lot of harm has been done to a lot of individuals, including you. I want to use it as a good time to make my own statement here is, I'm broke. No matter who wants to try to harass me, I am broke. Don't come to me. Go to someone richer. Well, you said it. I'll yield back the balance of my time because you can't say anything more than that. You want me to yield you, Mr. Barr? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, apparently there's more of a gulf between the 7th District of Georgia and Mr. Waxman's district in California than just geography. Um, in the 7th District of Georgia, uh, when you go to meet somebody a resta at a restaurant, if it's an up-and-up -up transaction, you don't go down to the basement, you don't have somebody sneak in through a kitchen door, you don't have them give you a pseudonym, uh, you don't have a discussion that talks about funneling uh, foreign money into this country. Uh, you don't have a discussion about $300,000 possibly being used to influence the U.S. election. Uh, and then have these people leave the same way they came in. And in the 7th District, you don't then get into a car and be advised by your companion who set up the meeting not to discuss the transaction or the discussion in the presence of a third party. Uh, and then uh, you don't then uh, have a continuing discussion about this person. You then don't find out and do nothing about it that this person, uh, by all appearances, uh, is the head of a foreign uh, military intelligence service. 
uh, and so on and so forth, so forth. Now, this may be the way the gentleman from California meets people in restaurants and has dinners and has discussions, but it isn't in Georgia. And these sorts of things raise very reasonable questions in the mind of many Americans. Uh, thankfully, the gentleman from California is not a U.S. attorney. Uh, if he were, uh, then uh, very, very few cases would ever be prosecuted for the benefit of the people of the United States because frequently U.S. attorneys are called upon to uh, look at accounts in which funds have been commingled, look at the intent of the parties uh, to the transaction, look at their words, draw reasonable inferences therefrom, and the reasonable inference that I think Mr. Chung and myself and others have drawn from this, but which the subtleties of which escaped the gentleman from California, uh, clearly indicate that there was, at least with regard to this one can characterize it as the gentleman, other gentleman from California, Mr. Lantos did, as was one very small part of a much larger scheme, or one can say that this was very important in and of its own right. But I think a reasonable inference, clearly, uh, for purposes of pursuing these matters further, if one is indeed concerned about, which some may not be, about the integrity of our electoral system, uh, and business as usual may be in California to take money from foreign sources. It is not business as usual in the 7th District of Georgia. Uh, and when we see in the 7th District of Georgia, or when we see as former U.S. attorneys, uh, that people meet under these circumstances, talk about funneling $300,000 and possibly using it for the re-election of the president, very likely coming from a foreign source, then further efforts made to obstruct justice, to intimidate witnesses, uh, these things set off red lights. One hopes that, uh, unlike the gentleman from California, these red lights have registered at our Department of Justice. Uh, and that these matters will be followed up on. Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate that you understand the subtleties of this, these matters much better than others do, that you are concerned about the integrity of our electoral system, that you see this as very strong evidence of foreign money coming in, that you focus on the intent of people like General G, uh, and that you draw reasonable inferences from the circumstances and the language that was used, as well as the evidence of foreign money coming in from different accounts, uh, than, than others do. I think this has been a very important hearing. I appreciate Mr. Chung being here, uh, and uh, I also appreciate his frankness in, uh, in indicating to us very truthfully uh, when certain things uh, were apparent to him, and he's talked, he's drawn a very clear line between his intentions and what he viewed as something as opposed to reasonable inferences about the intentions of others such as General G. Uh, and I think this has been a very important hearing for the American people, and I appreciate uh, the chairman holding it and hope that the Department of Justice uh, pays a little bit more attention than some on the other side seem to be willing to indicate. Will the gentleman yield? Will the gentleman yield to me? Uh, evidently, the gentleman doesn't yield. Uh, Will the chairman uh, allow me to make a statement since the gentleman referred to Well, um, I was going to make my final statement, but go ahead. We'll let you. I, I thank you. Uh, certainly, what we've had described is a pretty sus suspicious circumstances when uh, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Chung related, someone would enter through the kitchen and talk about how we should use the money and all of that. But when you look at the facts, when you look at the facts, I don't think that anybody's been able to establish that any of those nefarious plots ever actually took place. And we don't know uh, what people intended, but I certainly wouldn't give General Chi the benefit of the doubt, because all we know is what Mr. Chung has told us, and what he's told us is pretty damning. But uh, the, uh, the, what he's also told us is the reality was that he didn't get the money. As, he doesn't know that he got the money from any foreign government. He do, can't establish that. He got the money as part of a business transaction. He gave the donations, a small part of it in donations, as he saw fit. And there's nothing illegal with that. Okay. Thank you. Let me uh, just uh, end up by saying that uh, I share the gentleman from Georgia's uh, conclusions but I'd like to just add a little bit to that. And I understand the position that Mr. Chung's in. I mean, I think that anybody who's followed these hearings today understands the whole situation and, and how there has to be some concern about how he addresses some of these questions. But General G did come in through the kitchen. General G did use an alternative name. General G did suggest that $300,000 be given to the president the inference was definitely there. But even more than that, Mr. Liu used the name that Mr. Chung gave to Liu Chao Ying, the country girl. 
How did he know that? He only knew it because somebody in the Chinese government let him know that name. And so Mr. Liu conveyed that name, the country girl, to Mr. Chung to let him know that he'd better keep his mouth shut. That is pretty important. I'm not a lawyer, but it's pretty important because it says very clearly that, yeah, the head of the military intelligence met with you, and yeah, they wired $300,000 through Lu Chao Ying to you, and the country girl, a term he gave to that woman, said, you know, you better keep your mouth shut. And the FBI thought it was severe enough that he put him, they put him on a number of occasions into uh, a secure environment. And so I think that anybody who's followed this hearing today has to come to the conclusion that uh, the intent, not of Mr. Chung necessarily, but the intent of the Chinese government was through Liu Chaoying from the head of the Chinese military intelligence to some way influence American policy. Now, we don't know where the end is, but we do know that espionage has taken place at, uh, at Livermore, at uh, Los Alamos, and uh, that we've had some severe problems, that the man who was involved in the uh, espionage has been kept on over there for, for three years, that four times there was uh, uh, wiretaps denied. And all of these questions need to be answered for the American people. And Mr. Chung, uh, although uh, uh, it's been said here today that uh, by Mr. Lantos that you are a very small person in this overall mosaic, the fact of the matter is I think you were pretty significant in figuring out what the Chinese were trying to do. We haven't come to any conclusions yet. That's why I'm a little disappointed that justice hasn't taken more of an interest in this. Hopefully they will after this hearing. Uh, we're going to continue to look into these things. And I want to thank you, and I want to thank Mr. Sun, and I want to thank Mr. Murphy, and uh, the young lady back there, Miss Cohen. Cohen. And uh, Mr. Yan, we absolutely didn't need you as much as we thought we would today, but we do appreciate your, your patience in being with us. And with that, thank you once again. Uh, and I, I want to ask unanimous consent that uh, members be allowed to submit written questions to Mr. Chung. Hopefully you'll answer those for us, and that both questions and Mr. Chung's answers will be included in the record and without, uh, without objection, so ordered. And with that, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Take it back home. After the hearing, Indiana Representative and Committee Chairman Dan Burton said a few words regarding campaign finance reform. Here are his comments. Did you have some questions?